In fact, I think you talked about this on your hit podcast, Real Friends, Fake Doctors. No, you said it wrong. Fake Doctors, Fake Friends. No. On iTunes only? No. Real Doctors. If this is my plug, let's get it right. May I try it again? We'll rewind that. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had a sneeze. Fake Doctors. Real Friends. Real Friends. Where every episode is a unbelievable, not just recap, but like behind the Do you really scenes. listen? I've listened to a few. Oh. I was, you were selling the shit out like you were like an avid listener. I'm really good at this because I do a lot of ads. Watch this. Can I do it? Can yeah. I do enough for you? Uh, real friends first. Fake doctors, real okay. friends. So you guys, if you're not familiar, which I guess you've been living under a fucking rock, fake doctors, real friends available wherever you can get anywhere you want, right? Anywhere you get podcasts. Anywhere you can get podcasts. There's so much out there. And first of all, I just want to acknowledge you guys. Thank you so much to my Glassman Boppers and my Tyso Goblins for every week showing up. This has been such a fun episode, Zach. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. But with a sea of podcasts out there, what do I listen to? First of all, Scoot Doo, Blabbity Blue, Scoot D. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Are you very good at Rubik's Cube? I am. Are you very fast? I haven't been doing it in a while, but I was consistently under a minute. Wow. Uh, oh, Rubik's Cubes? I thought you were talking about sex. <laughs> I always think of a bit you did. I don't know if you still do stand-up, or, um, but that thing, Bill thought it was so funny, too, when you would get up on stage. You did a bit, I think I saw it at the, at the Laugh Factory. How you feeling? You good? Hell yeah. What are you up to? What'd you say? Let me call you back. Yeah, let me call you back. I'm about to start my show. All right, all right. And you were, on, you were on the phone. Yeah. That was funny. Thanks, man. Do you still do that? Uh, I don't do it often. I thought of it the other, like, a few times since I, since I saw you do it and laughed. So uh, I, I, I'm just telling you, as as your audience, you should all right. you should keep it in the mix. But then again, Bill, that's so ugly. Why do you want to put that there? Uh, it just it's an outdoor bottle, and the carpet is clean. I know, I know. Listen, it is what it is. I it's a tell, burden. It's not a joke. Sometimes I can't tell if you're uh, yeah exaggerating or not. But I'm sure you run into that a lot. I do. I've gotten a lot better at it, and we could talk about that if we need to. But I don't want to waste the time with you talking about my OCD again, but... Um, <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm laughing with you because of course I battle it myself, um, on, clearly on the spectrum, not as much as you, but I, I can relate. Um, but I wanted to finish the thought about the hoodie joke is that Bill... Bring this closer to you. Bill Lawrence, who thinks you're so funny, um, was teeing, was like your hype man. He's like, wait, do you see this new thing he does? It's so funny, it's so funny. And then I was like, well, you've probably built it up too much. Um, and it still landed. And it was still funny. You know, that's nice that that's what you see Bill doing. What I saw Bill doing wasn't so much of saying, Rick is great, watch this, as much as him saying, listen, he's a little, you just have to give him a chance. With, with, me, with me specifically or with everyone? I don't know about with you specifically, maybe not. With people that haven't met me yet. Um, I just remember I was at Well, you are intense, and, 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 but you know that. I'm, I've calmed down, look at me now. <laughs> It's a pleasure to have you here. I like Look, I do you a lot. Stuff. Anyway, you brought me to the Valley on the hottest day of the summer. And, you um, sound like drama and entourage now. <laughs> do you remember an Aquaman release? No, I don't, I don't think I didn't watch that show. But go on. Um, I want to I wanna give you an, um, a... Um, Roll. <laughs> is that why you brought me to get to get cast? <laughs> Come on. I, I want to I want to give you um, an affirmation, some affirmation. Okay. And, and and your audience listening should know that this is you are an inspiration because you are so tenacious. We'll be right back with a word from our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by Everlywell. Everlywell is offering listeners twenty percent off an at home lab test at everlywell.com slash Tyso. That's Everlywell. Dot com slash Tyso for 20% off your first lab test. Good. And it's as easy as easy can be. Let's do that, but with the melody that we that we uh, talked about. That says easy. easy. It's <laughs> as easy as easy can be for you to get healthy. 
Just prick your finger and place it on the paper. Put it in the envelope and sooner or later they will send you back the results. And you will know what you need to avoid to make yourself right. feel better. We're going to go That's back. Every no, well. they know. They know. <laughs> you are so tenacious. And I really have to give you props for that because you don't ever um, take no for an answer. You don't ever take being ignored. Um, you just you just keep asking. And I... <laughs> are, I you, are you saying no and ignoring me and I miss that? <laughs> no, I just... You know, even with this and your other thing you did, what was it, the sixth lead? The sixth lead. You, you just... You would never give up. And I, and I didn't want to do it, and I'm I glad know. I did it. I know you being, didn't. It ended up being funny, and I'm, great. I'm glad I did it. It was great. <laughs> Tell me why your car got so uh, Basically, production thinks my name is Rick Gladish. Until this very moment, I thought your name was Nick. <laughs> it actually was, a, it was, it hit me at the right time because I was editing a movie, and it was so stressful. I was directing my first studio movie, and it was very stressful. And, and, and you came in and we did a just, you know, an improv little sketch thing. It was at your, uh, where you were, at, where, where, where you I were was editing. Cutting, yeah, yeah. In the side room. And it just, re and we laughed so much doing it mm -hmm. that it sort of gave me a moment of reminding myself how much I missed doing that sort of um, improv acting sketch, not sketch, I never did sketch comedy, but you know, doing a scene and improv jokes through yeah. it. And so it was, it was sort of, it stuck with me because I was like, I got to get back to doing I remember acting. you said that to me. Remember you said that you missed that, like playing around, ad libbing shit. Yeah. Did that? Did you start doing stuff after that? Since then, I did a TV. I did a show that only went ten episodes. The um, podcast show. Yes. Coincidentally, about a podcast called Alex Inc. Um, shout out to Alex Inc. We'll put their Instagram handle here. <laughs> no, don't don't shout it out because Just put up a thumbnail. I don't even know if you could. I don't even know. You know, it's it was ABC. I don't even know if it's. On Did you forget the third letter of AB? A, it was AB. <laughs> it's AB. Uh, it was C or A. No, I'm saying I don't even know if 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 a show goes ten episodes and it's done. I don't even know if they keep it on their streaming platform. But we'll but 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 but, but you can check it out if, if we'll find out. We'll we'll put it up here. Give, well, give, no, no one's going to watch it. You don't have to watch it. But just it. so they know it's there. Will you give two it reactions? It clearly was a failure. What? If, if it's still up for streaming, I want you to res to say that it's up for streaming. And if it's not, give both takes and we'll use which one works. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. It's up for streaming. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, you could check it out at ABC. ABC it would be uh, Hulu probably. Yeah. No, that's NBC. No, no Hulu's Hulu aren't, it's, or Disney Plus. So you never know because right. they're the same company. What you're going to get. I actually had an issue with that using a Scrubs poster. We'll get to that in a second. But now, if it's not up, could we use that reaction? Oh, well, I guess we've learned that um, <laughs> if you only go 10 episodes, they don't, uh, they don't, you don't get the privileges. Well, that's a bummer. Um, no, it was fun. It was fine. It was cool. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I do love, love doing that. I do. My favorite part of Scrubs, when I look back, um, was Hulu. the joy of, um, uh, of, of doing what was written, but then riffing. And and, and as you know, um, from working with Bill, uh, he loves that. And For people that don't know, I did a show on Dateable. Bill Lawrence, put up a thumbnail of his episode, uh, also creator of Scrubs. Yes, our, our bond is Bill Lawrence. That's how we met because I did a little guest spot on Undateable. Right. And also I would come to Undateable and pitch jokes just on the side because uh, it was such a fun atmosphere. Um, and... And um, Bill, you know, I remain very close with Bill. I, I just, I, I was in his new show that he's got going on. I well, I directed this. Uh, second I was in episode London. Of I met Lasso. my, That's I, met, right. I met my now ex. We recently broke up. Oh, I'm We're sorry. Still very That's close. funny. We love you, Betty. That's funny. Here's some trivia for your audience. You put the music. One sec. Spotlight. Go ahead. There, the scene in episode two, season one of Ted Lasso, when we cut to Juno's photo shoot. Outside in Richmond, looking on, at the beautiful on the cliff, and she's shooting with a green man in a green screen uh, suit that will eventually become a, a lion, I believe, or a lion, a tiger, a, lion. a cat, yeah, something. And uh, you were there; you were visiting set that day. Oh, and then they get, and Jason and she get uh, paparazzi by the uh, paparazzi, paparazzo, singular for paparazzi. Really, I didn't know that. Paparazzo. I haven't had much run in with a, with paparazzo, let alone paparazzi. paparazzi. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you visited that day, yeah. And you were visiting your your then girlfriend. That's why you were there, or so, you found her there. So I love London. You know me, and boy, are my arms tired. 
So Bill knows I like London and he's going to be there for a little bit. And he says, if you want to come and do comedy here, you could stay with me. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm talking to this fucking chick on Instagram. Uh, you know, you know, you get it. That's how the world works now. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Well, I'm just saying you understand the yeah. world, yes. not you personally. Yes. You know, you go like, hey, what's up? You know, like, so anyway, there's this girl that lives in London that I was talking to. Uh, and I said, hey, I might be coming to London soon. Blah, blah, blah. Actually, kind of a cool story, but it's long. I don't want to get into it now. Um, I was going to go visit her. I couldn't stay with Bill yet. I had to wait a few weeks, but I'm like, I'm going to go early. And I'll also stay with this girl. You don't want to do that. Why don't you stay in a hotel? We were FaceTiming like every night for like two months. It oh, wasn't it was, like some random it thing. It was sexual. Well, I said to her, listen, obviously we're attracted to each other enough. I don't want either of us to feel any obligation. If, if I get there and you or me or both don't feel that, no pressure. I could get a hotel and or we'll just be friends. Um, I just don't want to feel any obligation for anything. Right. We both felt very safe. She was going to a wedding in Spain a few days later. So I was going to go with her and then I was going to go to Rome. So we wow, were like going to be travel so buddies. Bold. Yeah. And then, but, all, but incidentally, I met her. Two days later, I, I see you in Richmond and I can't fucking stand this girl. Really? She was just so, she was so cold to me when she wasn't on the phone. That's why you get a hotel. Well, I almost was. I was about to not go on this trip with her. But then a day and a half later, we had a conversation. She was cold for a reason and- you we, figured it out. Yeah. And then we, how long did you date? Uh, two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. Well, I was there for the beginning, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. On a cliff in Richmond shooting Ted Lasso, uh, episode two, season one. But I want to get into, I don't want to talk about that anymore. Okay. This is your show. You steer us. I want to talk about you. Okay. Now, this podcast is a great podcast. Okay. It's usually more conversational. Okay. I don't always do an interview and I don't want to make you feel being interviewed, but I do have questions. You can ask me anything. How much money do you have? Pass. How big is your penis? I think a decent size. It's not like <laughs> an eel or anything, but it's... Does an eel have a big penis? It's not like an eel. Oh, I see the joke. That was dumb. No, I... It's not... It's a fine penis. I'm proud of it. Yeah. What is your take on the confidence level of people based on the size of their penis, specifically in comedy? Zach. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I've noticed that comedians who have a more alpha aggro type of, fuck that. Oh, really? Like that kind of attitude? They generally have a bigger penis. Maybe. That's what they call a big dick energy, right? BDE, right. I'm not in the stand-up world, as you know. I've never done stand-up comedy. So I, I love stand-up comedy, but I've never done that. So that whole world that you're in, I know a bunch of people in, uh, in it. And I love going and watching people, but I've never done that. So I have a statement that is is uh, uh, I'm being very sincere about. You are, what you do is the dream to me. Mm -hmm. Like you're a funny, good looking, right? We're I'm Ish. putting us like we're Ish. like Ish. we're not going to be the hot guy, but also we can be. We're not if it's Ryan quirky. Gosling, right? <laughs> we could lead a movie, but we have to be quirky. Yeah, but we're not going to be opposite Margot Robbie. I might be. I'll tell you about that off air. Oh, my God. I'm pretty excited. <laughs> but you... Of all the actresses I picked, you might be getting a part opposite Margot she Robbie. She might be getting a part. Oh, wow. If she Listen accepts. You. She'd be stupid not to. Okay. Anyway, you are a funny man who does real stuff, mm -hmm. right? And that's because you made it yourself. Yeah, Is you that have fair to, make, to say? Yeah, you have to make it yourself, I think. Um, uh, that I, I, I. Sorry, I'd hate to just dis distract. You. I'm just making sure I told oh, you yeah. the cameras are going. Yeah, I think um, making it yourself is the key thing. In 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 Hollywood, you have to own your own material. Not not that that's the sole path, but one of your paths, I believe, should be um, if uh, make producing your own material. If you're not a writer, then working with someone who is um, to to have your own stuff. Did you know you wanted to direct or did you direct based on happen, like circumstance of needing to make your own thing that you thought would be a smaller, what was it, two million, two and a half million budget? Two and a half million was Garden State, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I always knew that I wanted to make things. And I, uh, you know, I grew up acting and going to auditions very young. And in North Jersey, I was about a 45 minute commute to Manhattan. And I would go on auditions when I was a, a teenager. And I think early on, I saw how many people were good actors, but weren't getting any work. How young? Um, probably around 13 or so. 
Okay. Uh, I went to a theater camp called Stage Door Manor, which is a, Shout and I was uh, scouted there by a manager who said, you know, the managers would come up to this camp because it's two and a half hours, three hours from New York, and it was kind of known as the best one if, for kids who are really serious actors. Was it hard to get into? No, you just had to have, be lucky enough to have parents that could afford it. I mean, I, do, I think they do do some scholarship stuff, but you had to, I was blessed that my p parents could pay for it. And, um, and I got scouted there. So she, she started sending me huh. audition for lots of movies like Big and Parenthood and- um, Who'd you audition for for Big, do you remember? Um, the, fr the Friend. Oh, really? Yeah, not, not Young Tom Hanks. The, the, uh -huh. the, oh wait, no, I take that back. Total, I was totally wrong, Young Tom Hanks. Right, he has a smaller role, Young yes, Tom Hanks. Yes, the smaller part, the smaller part. Literally. And, yes, literally. <laughs> and um, I auditioned for lots of, uh, I, I got a few callbacks for Paranoid. I met Ron Howard and, and read solely with him, but I was beat out by a young Joaquin Phoenix who- uh, That's the dude from Gladiator. He's in a few movies and he's very good. Yeah. Parenthood, I think, was one of his first movies and he was incredible in it. He was like, father to a murdered wife, husband to a murdered son. All right. I said it wrong, but he was opposite him in Gladiator. Okay, I didn't. I don't think I've, I've seen Gladiator since it came out. I saw it when it came out. It holds up. <laughs> okay, it really does. I'll revisit. Yeah, um, they're so, doing a re they're doing another one. You know that with Ridley Scott and uh, Russell Crowe. Thank you. Um, so anyway, my, my long the long the the short end of the story is that I I saw kind of early on in going on these auditions and also doing play readings for plays in Manhattan and stuff. That that there were, I would do I would go do a play reading for free in Manhattan mm -hmm. just because you know you, you, I, and I would play the kid part and then I'd sit at the table with these amazing actors and I just felt like I don't know that's one of the best actors I've ever seen and and I don't know his name and I think early on it implanted in my mind that I wasn't going to just pursue acting that I would pursue all sorts of things um, I filmmaking and um, and being a producer and being behind the scenes. So in the case that my lot that I never got a, my number didn't come up and I didn't win the lottery and, and actually be able to be a working actor, that I would be able to work behind the scenes in, in, in some capacity. When you're 13 and opposite somebody who's doing theater and you see him acting, how do you have the palate to recognize how good somebody is? I think I knew, you know, my father was super into theater. He would do community theater. He was a trial attorney. Um, he's now gone, but he was a trial attorney. And he, his hobby was community theater and he would always get the leads and I would go see him in plays. And then he'd bring me into New York to see Broadway, to see uh, um, independent movies. They weren't even called that yet, but movies that weren't coming into the suburbs. And so he just really um, loved acting and showed me movies that were way beyond my, my years. And, um, you know, it was the era of the video store and my sister and I would just say, oh, go get the the same movie we've watched 10 times and he would come back with something else um, that was, you know, Blazing Saddles or something mm -hmm. we, we, we would never have picked, but that he he thought, you know what, stop watching that, watch this. And um, and so I just think I uh, he sort of educated me and the camp of course educated me and I kind of got the taste for for being able to, the, the distinctions for being able to, to spot really good acting. You have uh, two brothers as well, right? I have two brothers. My sister um, passed away uh, to an aneurysm. Um, so I'm I have sorry. two brothers uh, alive. Uh, were any of your siblings into the arts the way that you were? Were you the only one who went to camp? No, they're both, uh, they weren't into acting, but both uh, brothers uh, do lots of things, but both write as well. Um, one more screenplays and one more um, novels and such. I'm, I'm want to kind of, I don't, I don't know what the question is, but hear more about the idea of you not knowing if you want to specifically direct, write, act, whatever it is, but to create, because I connect with that very strongly, but is there a way you could define that, what that means before you did it? And what you're doing now, is that what you pictured? Yeah, I mean, um, I just wanted to, you know, my father loved Woody Allen. I mean, Woody Allen is uh -huh. not someone we talk about much many, anymore, but uh, it, it's a, it would be dishonest not to say the truth, which is that my father loved Woody Allen and Woody Allen was prominent in my in my household, his films, his work. And he was sort of the, the ultimate in my father's mind as an artist. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably where the idea that you could write, direct and star in your own stuff got planted. So when you were creating, you also saw yourself in it from the beginning. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think what happened was, um, you know, 
Mm, let me think about that. It's funny. I, w- I went to film school. I went to Northwestern. Actually, what happened just to do a full Woody Allen um, period at the end of that thought was um, I was cast at 18 in Manhattan Murder Mystery. Um, Were you in Manhattan Murder Mystery? Yeah, I play his and Diane Keaton's son. Uh, much like you in Gladiator, I haven't seen it in a while. I'm only in one scene. I saw it in the theaters, though, I remember. It's a, it's, um, it's a, it's a great movie. It's a great movie. Um, I, I don't support Woody Allen. I don't believe in Woody Allen. I believe... Uh, I believe um, his daughter, but I. Uh, it is a good film, and it was a seminal point in my life. And I was 18 years old, and 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 that in Manhattan auditioning, getting to play Woody Allen and Diane. My, that, in the scene, I mean, my scene partners are Woody Allen, Diane Keaton, and Angelica Houston. And so the thought was, don't go, to, don't go off to college. I had gotten into Northwestern Film School. You should stay here and ride this wave. Right. I mean, this is huge. And I had to make a choice in that moment. And I stay uh, here, meaning what? Like move to Los Angeles? No, and this make- was out of New York, and it was kind of like there's no bigger momentum at the time. This was mm-hmm. ninety four. A uh, four, thank you. Um, uh, there's no bigger momentum than than getting this role. Um, you need to ride this wave uh-huh. here in Manhattan or or L A. But 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 I think the thought at the time was New York because I was young. I wasn't ready to make a move out to LA. Did it feel like a huge deal to get that movie? Yeah, it was huge. Right. Everyone who was a young Jewish yeah. boy who looked 18 <laughs> auditioned for it. And actually I'm the part still was competing with those people. The, the, yeah, we, 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 both, we both are. The part was actually a little bit bigger and um, it, it got cut down in editing. But anyway, I made the cut because people are infamous for being recast or, or cut and I made the cut. And um, and so, yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a huge, that was life-changing uh, in terms of, do you stay or do you go? And I and I was very clear that I wanted to go to film school. What was the voice that that made that decision for you? Uh, I just it, the fork in the road was was just that I'm going to have a chance to come be a struggling actor. Um, I'm just going to do it at 21. Um, I'm going to or I'm going to I want to be a filmmaker ultimately. I I I want to go study making movies. I also wanted to have the collegiate you know, experience. I Which want, had nothing to do with movie making. You just want to have like... No, I wanted to be on a campus. Yeah, I visited my brothers on... on, on and my, One of my brothers went to Wisconsin, Madison, and I had had that experience of seeing it and going, oh my, yeah, I want to have this life experience of going to, to college. I want to use this moment before I forget to shout out Small Town Wisconsin. One of my best friends, David Sullivan, has a new movie out and it's Wisconsin and I haven't talked about it on here and I'm sorry I'm interrupting. But put up a thumbnail. I'm not going to see that movie because you interrupted my train of thought. I didn't think you would see it. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. It's good. It's anyway, awesome. blah blah blah. I went to film school and uh, and did and, and also snuck into an acting class because um, at Northwestern at the time it was very bizarre. You sort of had to choose acting or directing, which is doesn't make much sense. Not because at all. Both are totally intertwined. I studied drama in college and we had to do like script analysis, costuming, lighting. Yeah, we had to do everything. Yes, but that's all theatrical. Uh, I'm saying uh, they may have rectified this. I don't know. But at the time, uh, 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 someone who aspired to be a director couldn't get into an acting class. And you did directing, not acting. Yeah, I chose film. Well, the film and the theater departments are separate, which is what I'm, what I'm saying. Understood. And the acting category, subcategory, is in the theater right. department, obviously. Um, but anyway, uh, because I had been done Manhattan Murder Mystery and because I had actually I had done some acting, professional acting work, a friend of mine... Um, helped um, me, talk me into uh, an, his acting class or his acting teacher. And so I got into an acting class. In New York? At Northwestern. Northwestern at Northwestern, right. Northwestern in Evanston, Illinois. Um, you're 21. Now you're like, all right, I've been in a movie and I'm a director, studied. I'm going to go to L.A. and do it? No, I came, um, I came back to New York. Um, I... Um, I, I I came back to New York and started auditioning and started. I got an apartment with some friends for, for a stage or for movies, for anything TV. and everything. Um, and also to make money was paing on music videos. Ninety seven was the was the apex uh-huh. of the music video era. Yeah, I think the Fuji spent like seven million dollars on a video. Like it, it TRL was, was the the place to be. TRL was the place to be. Exorbitant budgets. Um, most of them shooting in Manhattan. And there was a lot of work for young, hungry PAs. You didn't have cell phones at the time. We had pagers, and uh, your your pager would go off, and you. It was a matter of like who could get to the payphone first to try and get the gig. So what do you do? You learn from that, or is yeah, that just a month? Of paycheck? course, yeah. 
Um, well, so there were lots of PAs who didn't care. They would just go get high in the truck. And I was, I, uh, yeah, nice. I really cared. I was, I was, I was the hardest working PA there. I was so, uh -huh. but I was also trying to audition. So there were times where I'd be like in the truck and I'd be like, we'd have to go do run pickups. And I, my buddy would pull over the truck and I'd go up, run up to a waiting room and then be packed with like 20 guys who looked exactly like me. And I'd be like, oh my God, this is this is gonna be bad. And we'd sit there, he'd wait for me because he was such an awesome friend for like hours. Your friendship was for hours or he'd wait for you for hours? Are you still friends with him? He would wait for me while I went on the audition. Is this a guy that you're still friends with though? Yes, yeah. Is he working? Yeah, totally different career path, not, you know, but um, but anyway, and then, then we would come back and the, and the production manager would be like, how the hell could that errand have taken you that long? And it was because he had like, he had helped me out by like holy, staying with the truck while I ran to audition for something. <laughs> I did background work for a while before I was working. That's hard, uh, very hard. Um, I wanted to do it because it, it pay was okay, but I wanted to do it because I wanted to be around everything. I don't think I, I don't think it was like going to college by any means. You know, I watched a little bit of stuff here and there. The one thing it gave me was when I started working, which was on commercials, I felt comfortable on set. That was the only, that was the main thing it could offer me. Yeah, for me it was it was education. Everything I looked at is an education. I was just because uh, I wanted to do what they were doing. So yeah. I just I just asked so many questions. I I, I was really yeah. I was really t treating it like grad school, um, and I learned a lot. I saw and I saw some, you know, these were huge. I was only working on really big budget things, and it was just kind of trippy to come out of film school and then just all of a sudden be on these sets where they were just throwing money at you know Mariah Carey size videos. And it was kind of cool to, to experience that. And then, in, and then, this was ninety seven. I graduated ninety seven. In ninety eight, I auditioned for uh, a production of Macbeth at the Public Theater in Manhattan. Um, it was Alec Baldwin, Angela Bassett, Liev Schreiber, um, Jason Butler, Harner, Michael C. Hall, directed by George C. Wolfe, um, in, in in what was to be a three hundred seat tiny theater. And I auditioned for Fleance and young Seward, who were the two younger mm -hmm. roles in the in the play. And then I got it. Um, and it was my first job was that show. No pay, right? No, it was-, it was I mean, minimal, like- Yeah, 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 literally like whatever the minimum amount you can pay someone in theater in New York. Does is. that feel like, oh, I'm back? I did Manhattan Murder Mystery. I haven't worked for real on stuff and now I'm back? It just felt incredible, dude. I, I, I had I had studied Shakespeare with a great teacher in in, at Northwestern and really loved it and, and finally understood um, it for the first time. And then this was my first huge audition to be in a play with all these people. I mean, Liev Schreiber is arguably the best American Shakespearean actor there is. A lot of people might not know that, but um, people in New York theater know he's incredible. And George C. Wolfe is one of the biggest theater directors um, there is. And it was just, I got it. I couldn't believe it. Um, and that was life changing because that was, an, uh, education continued because now I was on stage with all these incredible actors and I was watching them, um, you know, tackle a really hard play. Was your dad around? Oh yeah, this was the, I remember going to take them taking me to, to, to dinner to celebrate. It was the... It, it, it was it was life changing. It was it, I, I would before I got it, I would walk by the theater and sort of like send mm. it, send the theater love because I was up for a long time. They really saw a lot of, I mean, you can imagine anyone in New York wanted to be in this play, and I was brand new out of college, and I just would. I remember walking. I walk by the theater all the time now because I live in New York uh, nearby it, and I, I always think when I pass it of being a young kid fresh out of college and like praying slash giving the building love, like, please, please, please. That's what I would do whenever I would uh, 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 look at the uh, the deadline article for, fuck, I forgot this way. What, uh, what was the movie? What was the movie you did that I was up for? Oh, uh, Going, going in, in Style. style. Yeah. I hate not remembering something for a joke. But <laughs> you're a text. I forgot about that. You're a text a joke to somebody and there was a little misspell and you just. Yeah, what a waste. It's so, I goof, get so mad. Yeah. Uh, but Going in Style, please, please. Um, so you didn't do comedy for until Scrubs. Um, correct. Uh, no, that's not true. While I was in, while I was at Northwestern, I came home for a summer and auditioned and got a part in an after school special. Do you remember those? Look at your hand and fingers and, and legs and mine. I just noticed it. Oh my goodness. You're, it's Cut your, to the wide shot. 
No, we'll do a split screen. Oh, you know what? You direct it. <laughs> and wide Scene. shot. Do it again. No mustache. Um, that's <laughs> wild. About opposite. I wonder if we mirrored energies. I think. Well, we, just... we have a lot in common. I think uh, in in a lot of ways the the um, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're very similar in a lot of ways. You're slightly um, be nice. More extreme in in. <laughs> I'm in, just gonna say suck. <laughs> no, I just say you're like I have OCD light. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that water bottle on the floor. It bothered you enough to put it on the tray because yeah. it's been outside. Yeah, that's why the blankets on the couch. I don't like outdoor clothes on my yeah. Indoor see, stuff. I don't. I, I I definitely on the spectrum of OCD don't have it that that. You that have intense. it. It's, that's nice. I, it's like Diet Coke. I have I have diet OCD. Yeah, but it's chemicals and it's not real. I'd rather. I do. Just... I do wash my hands a lot. Same. <laughs> so that's one of the classics. Um, Did you tap as a kid? I will. I, I want to preface this conversation with not that you're dying to have this conversation, but I don't want to talk about it too much because when I talk about them, they come more. Oh, uh, all right, and, then never mind. But I, well, I could acknowledge for a second uh, that was a big one. Yeah. Um, I also had one where I would skip. I would tap basically with my foot, and I would be embarrassed to do it in front of people. So I found that I could, when I get out of a conversation, you could do like, "All right, man, I'll see you," and like kind of skip. And you had um, to do it. I would have to do it. So sometimes I'd be in a conversation, but I'm not present because I need a tap. So I needed to find an out. I see. So I would be like, oh, I'll see you, man. And then oh. I would skip like that. It's funny, you know, as a child, you develop ways you don't even realize oh, yeah. to deal with them. And you look back as an adult and you go, I taught myself. Threw excuse up. me, cut that out. Animate S that. Excuse me. Um, I taught myself, I knew I was going to obsess at night trying to fall asleep about some topic. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> I taught my brain, why not obsess about something you're looking forward to that's exciting? And I and and that's how I, I would I was able to to get my circular reasoning going on something I was really looking forward to. Circular reasoning. Can you say that differently? Um I think that's just a, a probably a term my shrink has used about uh, is that obsessing. The obsessive, that's obsessing probably just thoughts? a, a fancy, fancy way of saying um just going round and round on a on a topic. You still do that? Uh, yes, that I still have in my life. I did tap as a as a kid. Um, I know you don't want to talk about this. The only thing I'll say is that I remember even now looking back as an adult that my rationale was um, I, if I don't kiss that teddy bear six times mm -hmm. goodbye, something bad yeah. will happen. And then I remember as a little kid thinking, I know that's ridiculous, but just to be safe, why not do it? It's kind of like religion. Yes, that's, I never heard of it put like that. That's interesting. Like, just in case, we'll eat the crackers. We'll right. We'll say our. We'll you know. Right. I mind. I mean, Hail well, Mary is just I a tap. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I just to be safe. Why? Why risk it? I don't want something bad to happen to my family. Because so then I'm it's survival. Them. Because then you're always thinking. of Because then you're needing to control your fate in ways that are illogical. And of course, but I'm, I'm, just I'm just saying, I'm telling you, even as a young boy, you that's know. how I, I was able to, to, to see that, um, that it was ridiculous, but I still did it. I just did Armchair Expert, Dax's podcast. Yes, I've been on that. And um, I'm looking at a picture of his beautiful wife nude in your, on, your, on your mantle. I am basically gifting you something yeah. and it's yours. Okay. Without, unless you give permission to give it to me. Okay. Okay. So okay. go ahead and open it and okay. you're, you, you yeah. know, it's fine. Okay. I can. Could I have this? <laughs> you can show it to camera unless you don't want to. If that's oh, yours, it's course. yours. Of um, course. I'm curious when this was taken. I don't recall her doing a nude shoot. Is this her or is that her face? That's, that's her. I don't even it was recognize her, it. It was this. for, uh, I forgot the name of the magazine. And uh, <laughs> he was talking about his, one of his was he would have to get naked to go when he was a kid to take his poop sometimes. And he would have to stand on the toilet seat and pull the toilet paper to go hit the, the doorknob and then come back. Like it was a very, it wasn't as a, it was a production. It wasn't like you have to, you know, his was like building something. Oh, I didn't know that Dax had an OCD. Yeah. Um, but you were talking, I asked about comedy. Um, oh, so I'm home from college. I'm, I'm working as a PA and it was funny because I would, as I told you, I was going on, a, I was working as a PA and simultaneously trying to audition, which is kind of tricky. And then I got a part in after school special um, for those of you who remember and were alive at the time, they used to have these on and they would be these sort of uh, one hour long specials for kids that would sort of, or teenagers that would sort of teach a lesson ultimately. 
And mine was um, my summer as a girl. Hmm? And um, it was pretty much the plot of Tootsie, but, but made to be for kids. My generation, it's Ladybugs. Okay. Do you remember Rodney Dangerfield? I, I, I never saw that. I was the guy was, dresses up as a girl to play soccer. Is this a similar thing? Um, uh, similar thing. Mine, more like Tootsie in that um, the only job left uh, on the island. I had a crush on a, a girl and I really wanted to be with her um, for the summer. And the only job left was as a chambermaid. And so I come up with this idea to dress up like a woman and get the job. And I get the job. And to just, to, and I'm, you know, I'm living the double life mm -hmm. uh, a la Tootsie. Uh, and then what happens a la Tootsie is that uh, a guy starts hitting on me aggressively. And I learn how horrible it is to be a woman and, and, and deal You're with here first. Zach Braff says how horrible it is to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't know that they make context. this after school special in 2022, but it did have an important, it was attempting to have an important message for kids to, to you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. <laughs> Maybe cantaloupe gives the wrong impression. Yeah. You know, too, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> Is that a comedy though? That's your comedy? Yeah, that was funny. I mean, there were, yeah, it was comedic. It was attempting Sexual to, harassment. That was the lesson one learned, but um, you know, just the, I, again, think like Tootsie, there's funny elements to it. Also, you had mentioned that the, the tools that we gain to overcome or to get through some of our OCDs. Um, do you have an example? Because I have a few that I figured out within the past few years, and I want to hear what you have to say. Well, I don't, I don't, as an adult, I, I don't have um, too many, um, I mean, I, I obsess when I'm falling asleep, for example. I have, I battle insomnia, um, and, and, and that's because my mind just won't turn off. It's mm -hmm. just obsessing about, a certain topic. Um, so I still attempt uh, uh, this many years later to, to, well, let's spin that obsession to a positive thing that's coming up, um, not something anxiety inducing. Do you meditate? I do, I do, um, on and off. Uh, I, I haven't been as diligent with it as I, as I was. I went through a phase where I was doing it every day, every morning, um, and now I'm trying to get back on that, on that groove. It helps, definitely. I didn't know- Do you know meditate at night? If if I do it and it's not enough, it's night for that for the obsessing. It's I mean thinking positive things are great, but the idea is to stop thoughts in general. Yeah, that's that's really hard uh, for me. Um, and I, uh, but it does help when I meditate. I, I was doing it when I was doing it regularly in the morning because it was a great way to start your day, um, and use those mm -hmm. the sort of theme of of keeping your mind quiet throughout the day the sleep meditation was i like because it's literally just breathing and you're listening to somebody and when you're listening to somebody and you feel like you're doing stuff because you're breathing that's it takes minimal thought but then you're not thinking of anything other than following the directions yeah. and that really helps all right i'll try that i've been i've been i've, I've at, uh, i'll send you one i i, I it's uh, that's something i've battled uh, on and off my whole life is insomnia uh, it wasn't until uh, the past few years that I realized how much of the things that I was trying to, my obsessive compulsive stuff, and put that in a broader character that, uh, category than OCD, but basically just the anxieties, the OCDs, the need for control, the missing certain things that I, I, I'm not, things that weren't intuitive to me just in social situations. Mm -hmm. And I learned how much of my comedy voice, or I, I mean my, literally the language of comedy, how much I did to overcompensate. And when I was exhausting other people and not realizing how much I'm exhausting myself, but if I don't find a funny way to tell you to sit on the blanket and take your shoes off and don't turn that this way and what does it mean when you're squinting and all these whatever things, I, I had to make a joke out of it. Mm -hmm. And I learned that people received me at least good enough. And then my complete language of communicating with people was entirely bits. Mm. And I'm grateful for learning how to do comedy, but it, I, I, it's exhausting. It's exhausting and I have a lot of compassion for me yeah. uh, and have a lot of compassion for my younger me, um, but I'm able to see it a little bit differently now. And I mean, I just didn't have the tools, but comedy like saved me. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, like you said, and I've got it for, I mean, I'm, that's not as much as I used to, but I don't know if you're joking, if you're serious. And 
and I've talked about this before on my podcast, but I never found those two things to be mutually exclusive. If I could be joking around with you, because that was a way that connect, because if you're laughing, I know at least we're connecting, because otherwise yeah. I don't know how you feel. But it just can't be nonstop. And I and do think you were a bit exhausting when I first met you. I know. <laughs> Funny stuff, Zach. Hi, Faffing. Oh, hi, Mom and Dad. Hi, babe. Hi. Oh, is it worth us acknowledging, um, because you weren't sure if you wanted to do this and how you looked, that, you, that my parents are hungover today? Because there was a neighborhood block party and mom was doing jello shots. Her and first jello shots ever. And dad was just very stoned and it is. Uh, not for his first time. But that's not why we're here, because this podcast is sponsored by one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven. Everly, Everly, Everly well. well. I know it well, too. We'll bleep this, but mom has a lot of diarrhea, poops her pants a lot. <laughs> and we we're trying to figure out what was going on. And there was, a, I actually am about to take the food sensitivity test. I already took the men's health one. But mom, you took the food sensitivity test. Yep. Explain the process. It took three minutes. Exactly. I mean, I went three into my minutes. kitchen. Yeah, three minutes. I went into my kitchen. Mm -hmm. I followed the instructions. There you go. I pricked my finger and I, all you do is touch the dots. Take action today for a healthier tomorrow with Everly Well. Their at-home lab tests and vitamins and supplements could help you get the knowledge and support you need so you could become a healthier you. Isn't Everly Well offering a discount for Tyso listeners? Everly Well is offering listeners 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash Tyso. That's everlywell.com slash Tyso for 20% off your lab test. You know what I liked about it the best? Tell me, Dad. What? It got my wife in the kitchen. <laughs> I mean, come on. What a funny man. That's Everly Well. E V E R L Y W E L L dot com slash Tyso. Everly Well. Wow. Talk about, you know, things that are great. Hi, I'm Rick Glassman from the Take Your Shoes Off podcast. And these are my parents, mom, 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 and dad. Pops. And I wanted to use this opportunity to thank all of the boppers and goblins out there who have been just hardcore listeners and watchers. Thank you so much for watching. I'd like to add to that, okay? I wasn't done. <laughs> I also want to say... This is, this well, you is faded crazy. out like you were. <laughs> Go ahead. I love you goblins. You've supported us for years. We've grown. You goblins, you're part of my heart. I love you. Love you. Mom? Yeah, babe? Do you have anything you want to say? Well, I'd like to sing a little song. Why are there so many songs about rainbows and what's on the other side? Rainbows are visions and only illusions, and rainbows have nothing to hide. That works. What's no. so amazing yes. that keeps us stargazing, and what do we hope we might see? Someday we'll find it. The Rainbow Connection. Changed it Everly Well. For, for Everly, Everly well. well, you and me. <laughs> Jake! Oh, Ricky. Let's go back to Zach. The hangover. How does Ricky's voice sound today? I am a... Whatever. Back to Zach. <laughs> That's a testament to your charm. You were you're, you were so darn charming that even though you'd be like, oh, dude, don't do a bit every two seconds. You said that to me once. I said that again. It made me actually, uh, and I almost want to do shirts. My eyes are watering because I say this on here sometimes when just there's like sincere things. You said it to me. It was at the rooftop of, I think it was Sarah Silverman. She had a party. It was somebody like that had like a cool rooftop thing. Do you remember this? Yes. Yeah, Sarah Silverman had a party on her roof. Then it was that. And we were laughing a lot. And I know that because I felt, I feel close to people when we're laughing. They make me laugh, I make them laugh. I just was having a great time. And then you said, uh, you're, it was something like you're doing it too much or it's not, <laughs> whatever it was. It was- I was probably stoned if I was on Sarah it, Silverman's roof. I'm sorry if I- No, no, no. That, that's like, tell me. I, I've, I've learned how, you know, it's not everyone else's job to tell me that. And I, I do know that. But it, it's, you know, it's not your job to keep a booger out of my nose, but it's nice if you say, Rick, you know, you got a booger. Most people don't do that. Right, but I don't know that I, I think. I'm saying I, that, oh. that made, I liked that very much. Okay. I remember you said that. And I remember after that, I went, oh, and Rick, you do this. 
you know, you're doing great. You're charming. You're funny. You got to sit back. You got to chill, buddy. <laughs> you got to chill sometimes. Let it breathe. Yeah. And I missed my, what I, I prefer, my dismount. But I remember that. And then I, and then I chilled for a little bit and I just felt appreciative. But that, I hope I didn't, I, you, I'm glad you're saying that you're, you're, you're appreciative, but I hope that I didn't hurt your feelings in any way or, 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 uh, I, I, I think I, I, if I recall, and I vaguely recall, I was saying like, almost like you would, I mean, we, we don't know each other that well, but to a close buddy being like, dude, yeah, you, of you're course, beating tell the me. joke to a fucking dead horse, stop. Yeah, a hilarious joke, <laughs> charismatic. I don't know if what's in here, uh, but when we were setting up, you mentioned the clock and I made some joke about why it's, it's yeah, why it stopped. Yeah, the joke was good. Um, Your clock is inaccurate, which for an OCD person, I do that feels like you might be a fraud. Do the purpose to remind me that, uh, that, that uh, time even, is in Jerusalem. Well, even things that are so uh, powerful as time uh, is often wrong. And to uh, not let the ego get in the way of the information. Wow. I just ran out of batteries. <laughs> but it, it was inspired by something. I said something. Have you used that joke with other people? I give different reasons. A few. It's only come up a few times. I don't remember what they are. But oh. but because you know when you think someone came up with a spontaneous joke and you're kind of like that was quick. He's good. And then you think, oh, that, he's a comedian. That's he said he's done that no, bit twenty that, times. No, I I I'm, I don't reuse. <laughs> it's actually quite a problem. It's good. Bill, I remember told me that. Bill's like, Rick, that joke works. Why don't you do it? I'm like, because it worked. <laughs> you know, I did it. Yeah. Well, sometimes you gotta. Sometimes you you can get into a thing with TV comedy, especially where you where you're trying to beat a great joke, just stick with it. I mean, there's no harm in getting lots of options, right? but make sure you have the thing that everyone thought was funny first good. You know? Yeah, uh, I just said I feel like a liar. What um, do you mean? If I, if, I, if I said something to you and passed it off as I just came up with it, right. I'm lying to you. And right. I, that makes, now I'm, now I'm a liar. Right. But I, the reason I bring it up, I wanna say is because what I said was something inspired by a real thought, which was, um, about the mistakes and the clock is wrong. That was the joke part. But the truth was, if you value information enough, it surpasses the ego. And that's where I've really benefited to where, Rick, you're being too much. Rick, you're being too loud. Rick, that's annoying. We don't like when you do this. If I genuinely want that information, which I do because I need it and we all need it, but I, speaking for myself, I need it. If that information is important enough, then it's not about me. I mean, it involves me, but it's like, even if I disagree, it's obviously too loud for you or it's too much for you, so that matters. So it doesn't make me feel like I'm lesser than, it makes me feel like that makes me better, mm. that, that informs me. So when people say, Rick, I just, it makes me feel very close to them. Mm. And it's like, oh, I could be around this person. Had you said it earlier, you probably would have, it would have been easier, but I like it. Well, I think we were laughing, we were having a good time. It's the weird, I'm moving on, but it's the weirdest thing that I still haven't figured out yet. We're laughing. We're having the best time. How am I supposed to know when it's time to stop laughing? But wasn't there a chance that maybe everyone around you, I don't know if you smoke weed, I don't anymore, but at the time I did. Yeah, I was probably high. I think we were all probably high. And then you, then you kind of, you know, so. That's that. an excuse because it's the same when I'm not high. Okay. But what, what were you gonna say? Isn't there a time when what? I'm just saying if three people are sitting around telling stories um, and they're high, you, you can you can very easily slide into being too sensitive or or overthinking something. Let's pretend we're not high. Okay, let's say it's you, me, and and two other people. Yes, people. Was there an option for them to be animals? Yeah, goats. Um, two goats, two people, and the two goats, of course, we're talking about LeBron and Jordan, and we're all laughing. Right. We're having a great time, right? Or at least we think we are because we're all laughing. Then you do a joke. Imagine this, imagine you're- I think they're bleeding. What do you mean? Um, not with a D, with a T, goats bleat. What does bleat mean? That's the sound goats make. See, you're making too many jokes. I'm trying to, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. You're throwing it back at me now. <laughs> Everyone's laughing and you're being you, you're right. charming, you right. know, you're in the pocket. You know right. what it's like to be in the pocket. You have yeah. a little size, you're doing a little of this, you're yeah. doing your thing, you're yeah. feeling good looking. And people are laughing, then all of a sudden someone goes, stop, dude. It wasn't like that. No, no, I know, but I'm saying, how would you know, how do you know when to stop? I sometimes stop when I feel like I don't need to, just okay. so I don't miss it. I just, you said that you had troubles with uh, reading uh, social cues. Other than laughter. It's the only one I recognized. Okay. Well, I just think that, I, I don't know. I, 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 I feel like my experience of you before um, was that 
there were times when you just weren't reading the room right. All right, it's as simple as that. I think I'm reading the room now. Let's move on. <laughs> I could do that. When someone takes a breath and they're not making eye contact, I've learned it's maybe they just need some oxygen, but let's move on. Um, uh, scrubs changed your life or the Shakespeare thing changed your life? Um, they both did in their own way. It's, it's, you know, it's like a, a, a graph that's going up. Um, getting Macbeth uh, changed my life because all of a sudden my agents were paying attention, whereas they weren't paying attention. They don't really pay attention if you're not getting work. How'd you have agents before that? Uh, I had, I, uh, I kind of hit a hip, um, what's the word? I, hip? I, I, <laughs> is it hip? Is that the word's not hip. Um, what's the word I was trying to think of? Uh, hopped? I don't know. As a child, I had some men. Oh, hip pocket. No, uh, although that isn't, that is a, that is an industry term that your, your listeners probably don't know, but, um, it wasn't that, um, what I'm trying to say, I'll start over just is that I had some representation as a child, went to college and they stayed representing me. Then when I came back, it was time to get me a, an adult agency and, but I had a manager and the manager got me an adult agent. Now the adult agency um, was barely paying attention to me. Mm -hmm. And then I got my first thing, a much, a much sought after role in a high profile play. And all of a sudden they were listening to me. And you're 23? Um, it was two, it was 1998 and you were uh, born in, so you're 23, born in 75. Yeah. Um, and then what? Um, so I got that and then I, and then was out of work for a long, couldn't get any acting roles after that for a while, but was PAing. And then I got a little indie, um, with Heather Matarazzo called uh, Getting to Know You and BB Newworth. And then, uh, and Mark Blum, the late Mark Blum, who just passed. And then that went to Sundance. That was, that was a really exciting experience. That was like, oh, shit's starting to, to gurgle. Mm -hmm. And uh, that movie went to Sundance, which was very exciting. And then I went, then I got another part. Uh, Greg Berlani, a very um, big showrunner now in, in Hollywood, uh, his very first film was a film called The Broken Hearts Club. And I, I was that. I was cast in that. It's a it's a movie about young gay guys in West Hollywood, and who um, Greg wanted to make a movie about his friends. He said, you know, people make gay films, but they don't. No one's ever made a movie about like people that are like my friends. Some of them are. Um, or, there's all different types of, of of gay men, and he didn't feel that he was being represent, represented. And so he told his story about five gay friends living in West Hollywood, and had Dean Cain and myself and Timothy Oliphant and Billy Porter. It was his Billy Porter's mm. first big um, movie, I believe. Um, and um, and that went to Sundance. So then I was like two years in a row at Sundance, which was a good look for my agents and for me. What do you feel like, like? When you're doing this, does it feel like I've done it? I'm doing it? No, it's happening. Like shit's going according to the dream. Shit's like right. uh, the stuff I've manifested or tried to manifest since I was a kid, really. Um, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. It wasn't a mistake to 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 leave the off the momentum of that movie. It was smart. To Had you been call. thinking about that for a while? Yeah, you, you you know, when anyone anytime you make a big choice at a fork in the road, you go, I hope that was the the right one and and it it was it was starting to pan out. I still didn't have any money. In fact, I moved out here. I followed a girl out here. A woman I met at Sundance um was out here. And we had started trying to long distance date. Yeah, nice. <laughs> So in the back of my mind, I was like, I eventually have to go out to Hollywood because this is back in the day. Now everything's on on the web. Yeah. But back in the day, you would audition for something in New York, and you'd have to wait. I mean, back in the day, it was that was three years ago. I mean, no, this I'm talking about '99. No, I'm saying up until three years ago, it's still like that. Right. Um, it's longer than three years ago, but I feel like just pre-COVID. No. No, I'm talking about like videotapes being FedExed. Gotcha. I thought you meant doing things in person. No, what I meant was if you're auditioning in New York and every all the all the TV, all much more TV is in New York now, but that's irrelevant. All the decisions were happening in LA. And so I would audition not in the room. You know, when 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 you're auditioning for something and you can be in the room with the filmmaker or the writer and you can they they can see your personality, you can schmooze them a bit, you can make people mm -hmm. laugh like like you do, and hopefully like I do. And then 
so you didn't have that. You were in New York and you were reading with a reader and they would send the videotape to LA and you were always at a disadvantage. And so I, I knew really off this momentum, and of course I was in love with this young woman, um, it brought me to LA. I was waiting tables because I had zero dollars. My, my parents gave me $5,000 to buy a used car, which I used every penny of. So I had a Nissan 240SX um, stick shift and I cool. had not a, not a dime to my name. Tell me, I like to visualize it. Where were you waiting tables or what kind of restaurant? Um, it was a French Vietnamese restaurant. It was the inspiration for the beginning of, of Garden State. It was a, um, you know, the French colonized Vietnam and um, um, this, and in some in some ways their cuisines uh, became one. My <laughs> first job waiting tables was a, a, a French kosher restaurant in Beverly Hills. Really? Yeah. That's a spooky way our lives are overlapping. I don't. I never use this right, but small world. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get back to the same. <laughs> <laughs> that was trying Fuck. to get back to the same. I know. Pose again. Um, that's funny. Um, so it was a very fancy. Le Colonial. There, there's some still. There were like five of them, and uh, ones in Manhattan. I think still. Um, I'll have to go. Actually, Morgan Freeman told me it was his favorite restaurant in Manhattan. Um, Le Colonial was a was in Beverly Hills. You know where the Leica store is at Beverly and Robertson? No. Really? You don't go into West Hollywood, Beverly Hills ever? I don't leave the house. <laughs> okay. I walk people in. Well, anyone who out. knows uh, the Hollywood area of Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, there is a, a Leica store at the corner of uh, Beverly and Robertson. And it was a giant store and it used to be the restaurant. Um, and I would wear a tunic and... Um, my movie that I was in, the Broken Hearts Club, was playing at the nearby movie theater. While you were waiting tables? Yeah, and people would come from after the movie. Oh, that's, cool. that's great. And they'd, I'd wait on them and they'd do a double take and they'd say, we just saw your, your movie. And I'd say, oh, thank you. Uh, let me tell you about the specials. Only in Hollywood can you uh -huh. go see a movie and then have one of the stars of the movie uh -huh. wait on you for dessert. <laughs> did did that make you feel embarrassed or proud? Very embarrassed. In fact, I would have these meetings during the day where I'd go into you know to some, meet some producer and I'm talking about my careers on fire and I and I, yeah I was yeah we just went to Sundance two years in a row and great things are happening and then I, I'd like look and they'd be like hey you have table twenty two and I'd look and it was the guy I had just doesn't that make <laughs> you look cool though? No, it makes you look like. You were, well, everyone understands how this town works. Yeah. So you're, you're an unemployed not actor. Not everybody, you're, not people that don't know Hip Pocket, but. People that don't know, well, pe I think most people who aren't in the business still know that uh, struggling waiters uh, wait tables because you, know you need to be free during your day to audition. I waited tables until, uh, even through, after filming the pilot of Indatable, until we started production, I was waiting tables. And I remember people would come in all the time to apply for jobs. And when people apply for jobs, they bring in headshots. This is Headshots exactly, for, this, is, this is in Garden State. Do you remember? The, I don't know if you remember this. I don't remember that. I've seen Garden State since Manhattan Murder Mystery, but I've seen Gladiator okay. sooner. Okay. Well, in the opening- of Garden, I do remember. In the opening of Garden State, yes. just, to, just to bring all of this full round, yeah. my manager, who this really happened, but I had George C. Wolf, the famous theater director, play the manager in the movie. Oh, good. Authentic representation. Well, it was just hilarious that like it had come, by the time I got to make the movie, uh, I was able to say to George, who's like, you know, a New York legend and, and now a, a big filmmaker as well. I said, will you play this character? And he was like, oh my God, it'd be so fun. And so he plays the manager who is waving headshots to me. If you're late again, I'm gonna give this, your job to, and, whole, and points to a headshot, this kid from Duluth. Um, and, and it's a weird Hollywood thing that people would, uh -huh. along with filling out the application, provide their, their headshot. Yeah, it is weird. I, <laughs> I what don't think that, that happens in any other place. No, I can't, I can't right? <laughs> it probably is like, hey, look, I'm good looking. You want good looking yeah. people working Well, that's weird what it is. Well, I imagine if somebody who grew up in Los Angeles moves, moves to you know Des Moines and is- uh, Applying for a diner job. Yeah, do they bring it? Or <laughs> no. Technically it's called auditioning for a diner job, but do they bring their headshot? And no. like, what the fuck? I don't think they even do that in New York. I doubt they don't do it here anymore. Well, people don't have physical headshots anymore. Right. I used to be very insecure about it. Can I show you my headshot? I don't think I've ever I've shown it to you. I've seen it to you because when you auditioned for me, you brought it in. That was my that was Actually, my your bit was, uh, you, brought in a, you brought in a picture of David Schwimmer. Well, it's a proper. <laughs> it was you. a whole shtick you did. It wasn't a whole shtick, it's a throwaway. Well, I don't, I don't think you should do that. Why? It, it wasn't that funny. You're wrong. 
It, it upstaged your um, your performance. Do you think so? Yeah. No, I don't know where it is now. <laughs> Just uh, vamp. Well, I thought you were a very funny actor, and your perf- and your audition was very funny. I mean, you know, I'm a fan of yours, but I I thought bringing in a a, a comedic prop was was a, a bit much. Here's the thing. Though. He's not in the room, audience. What he did was he came into the audition Here. and provided a headshot of David Schwimmer. No, it's my headshot. <laughs> It's fun. Look, at you're laughing even you know, even though you said it wasn't funny. Show the camera. Well, now I see the joke that I that I didn't yeah, see that before. You missed. Oh, I see the joke. That was dumb. No, what I missed was that he's taken a headshot of David Schwimmer. <laughs> at the bottom, he's put his name, Rick Glassman. That's funny. But yeah. This is now. I have time to study it. In the, at the moment, you came in. No, I came in cool. You came in hot. I don't come in. I always knew to come into audition. <laughs> you don't come in hot. You came in hot. Maybe I came in hot. You came in hot. You were, it, it's anxiety inducing. I, I audition. I, I still occasionally audition when I really want something. I, 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 know, I know the pressure. Although now, of course, in 2022, we just send in videos of ourselves. Yeah. So. But I know I learned before I learned inner socially, I learned in auditions. You could always add energy. Come in fucking chill. Especially it helps that that headphone joke that you like where I'm wearing the headphones yeah. and they say, hold on. The reason I would do that joke, it's a good joke. It's a great joke. I don't know why you don't open all your shows. I have a few jokes that serve that same purpose. And that purpose is... By the way, Northwestern grad. Oh, well, David Schwimmer. Shout out to David Schwimmer. Yeah, let's do a link to, link, link to uh, Northwestern. Put it lower, lower third. If you want to apply. We'll put actually a link to description for <laughs> Northwestern. And uh, uh, it's a, to do a joke where... People know you're being serious, and then they find out that you're not being serious. I feel has, is a really good way of tr- conditioning the audience for the act that it's about to be. So when I pull the headphones out, they realize, oh, he, he, Trey, 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 Trey. Oh, fuck, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> so if you come in low energy and you hand them that, they go, is this well, real? Can I say something to you? What do you guys think? And this is advice for every actor out there, and you can take it or leave it. Don't ever fucking bring a prop into an audition, unless it's a cell phone. Where are you going now? I'm going to prove you wrong. And we're going to do a little improv scene. Can I don't want to do an improv scene. We're going to do a little improv scene. And I'm going to be auditioning. Do you have a project that's coming up that I could actually audition for and I could use this as a pre-audition? I'm going to direct an episode of, of uh, Bill's new TV show. Um, there might be a role for you in it. In uh, the, the uh, Harrison Ford one or the yeah, Vince Vaughn one? the Harrison Ford one. I was offered a role in it and I was out of town. And it's, I'm on two shows now, two network, huh? Amazon and ABC. <laughs> and there was a, there was an oh issue God. with it. They needed me for upfronts and oh blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, I don't need an audition for it. I'm, buddy, have you seen the new Emmy magazine? No. You're You're... Do I need to audition anymore? Oh my goodness! I'm sorry. That's that's, that's me not sharing. Even you. Oh, that's me. Oh, doing the wow. rock cuff thing. Oh, that's a good look. The adjusting the cuff. Now there was an episode of The Office. I think it was the British one. I don't know if they recreated it in the American one, where he he keeps out um, a picture of himself on a, on a magazine on his desk. That's what you're. That's what you're doing. Yeah, you I love keep, The Office. You keep an uh, you keep a copy. Audience. It just came out. Audience, he keeps a copy Just of a magazine out. that he's in next to his. Well, I chair. showed it in an episode not too long ago, and I he kept it there. Um, hi, my name is Rick Glassman, um, and this is my friend Puppet Rick, and oh, we are no. here to audition for the role of. Talk about an unreal joke. <laughs> Wait, did you do? Um, is that from the 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 Undateable. prank call show? No, it's from, but the same guy that did Crank Anchors. Oh, you should do a Crank Anchors. You've already got the puppet. <laughs> <laughs> I've become a prop. Oh no! Look what happened. His ear. You're a prop comic. I've become a prop comic accidentally. By the way, the, the, there's not that many prop comics, are there? You are correct. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I got to watch on YouTube. Oh my god! You really, really, really shouldn't bring any props into an audition unless it's your own cell phone and there's a scene involving a cell phone. That's my two cents. I, as someone who occasionally is, is auditioning people. But you, but you can take it or leave it. That headshot, now that you saw it. Yeah. And I come in and I'm cool. I'm not coming in hot. I'm like, hey, do you want a headshot? And you know what's happened? If they say no, I don't give them the headshot. And what I do is I put it down on the ground face up. So if they clock it, they laugh. The problem with this joke, if I can just give it, it yeah. needs to be studied. And, and what usually happens is right. someone comes into an audition room, they hand you their headshot. You know what they look like. So you go, thank you. And you put but it. That, but there's no harm, no foul. 
That's the thing. And that happens often. And I think that's even funnier because if they don't see- I'm not going to go back and study but that, the But then it doesn't and matter. The, in, this, in this instance, I, I was here staring at it and then I was able to pan down to your name on it. And that's Pan fun. down. It's an eight by 10 paper. It's, it's tilts not a- down, actually. It's technically tilts tilt down. It is tilt down. Um, and it and, um, and um, I just got to say that it made me laugh this time. But this isn't to recreate the moment for those of you watching the video. Say, so there we were. When we recreate a moment, we go, so there we are. You got to do that. Why do I have to do Storytelling that? Storytelling technique. That's <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it gets people in. All right, check this out. Zach, so listen, there we are, right? You know me. You know, you got to do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. Um, anyway, I, I, he hands, there we are, and he hands me the headshot, and I, and I take it, but I don't, I, don't, I, don't have it, I don't look at it. I know what he looks like. He's right in front of me. I know him actually personally. That's why headshots are fucking weird to me. But they're, they're an old school thing. Now we look at IMDb. We don't, you don't look at... At, it, it used to be a thing. Actually, I was interning one summer home from college at the Tribeca Film Center, and I was asked to go into a casting director's office. A casting director needed an intern, and I went in, and the assignment from this casting director was, can you throw away this giant box? The box was the size of your ottoman. It was huge. And I said, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. I'm just happy to help. And I opened it up, and it was filled with thousands of headshots. The cash director had just finished casting a movie and now uh -huh. needed all of these headshots in a dumpster. And I was, it was just such a moment. I mean, if you put in a TV show as an as a aspiring actor opening up this box, you'd think that's a little heavy. Handed. Everything's copy though, right? I mean, it's a good thing to use. Oh, you're saying you think it would be not realistic. It would be heavy handed, but it really did happen. The aspiring actor has an intern job and, and the assignment, his first assignment is to throw away a thousands yeah. of headshots. It's a good imagery of showing how, how, how many people are trying to do what you're doing and right. it's all trash. Right, so what I did was I secretly took about- I'm already with you, I know what you're gonna say. 200 of them and put them in my backpack. Yeah, and that was your headshot. <laughs> and I would walk that. into all my auditions with 200. No, um, oh, my, I, my, my friend and I were staying in a, in a, in a, in a cheap sublet and we, it was, wasn't decorated. So we decorated right. all the walls with the hundreds of headshots. Like of, it's a dry cleaner's office, <laughs> but they're not autographed. <laughs> right, like a dry cleaner's office, but every inch of the, of the whole apartment was headshots. Also, how out of touch are we with the working man when we refer to dry cleaners as an office? <laughs> I'm not out of touch with the working man, Rick. Why don't we pretend that there's a part for you in, in the show I'm going to direct? Um, don't bring the puppet out. The talus was a great ad, though. Mm -hmm. Here's what I played me. a temple, so my aunt made me that talus. <laughs> I, I used the puppet before. I'm like, can we get a talus? And she made it for me. And now I always <laughs> use it. It's a great joke, by the way. I don't think it's a great joke I have with the puppet. I don't think that there's a funnier bit for Jews than you bring out the puppet first. Right. Beat, beat, beat. Bring out the talus. That's hilarious. Then please use that whenever you play a temple. Yeah, I mean, do you what, play synagogues? <laughs> <laughs> um, I love playing synagogues. Uh, it's it's a great way to meet uh, daughters because afterwards all the moms are just you. Are you single? Right, right, right. Uh, and also like your daughter's not going to be hot enough for me. But you can't say that, you know. How do you know? That's the, in the movie version. Uh, her, she comes around the corner and she's the the most perfect, beautiful. <laughs> type for you. So do you want to make that movie? Yes, I would like and you I'll, to audition. I'll play the Don't dad. bring out the puppet. <laughs> Hear me out. Um, I want to tell you what the joke is. Okay. I think I've said it on the podcast before. I'm not sure, but I don't want to tip it for people who come see me now, but whatever. If you're a fan, enjoy the, you've heard it. Are you going to do the hood joke for the hoodie joke for these fans? Have they seen that? I'm not sure. I haven't done it here. No, it's a great interpersonal joke because I always have headphones in. So I'll be talking to people for, you know, if you're talking to them for a minute and a minute's too hold long. Hold on one sec. I was on the phone with my dad. What's up? No, a minute. It works. Oh, I see. You know, because it's, it's. I'm just saying how long on stage. On stage, it can't be that long because. It's got to be 15 seconds. Right? Well, it's got to, it's got to work both for being on the phone and the audience. So I do, I do. How you doing? Come on. You, I can't hear you. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, let me call you back in a sec. Yeah, because I have the earbuds under the hood, so they don't see the headphones. Yeah, but when it's, I'm, it's very funny and it's very unique. I've never seen anyone open their set like that. You know, similar to the headshot thing, the problem that the, that, that the hood thing works. This doesn't work. Well, you in laughed, my humble uh, opinion. In my humble opinion, look at it again. <laughs> Just look at it. You're laughing, thinking about it. <laughs> it's funny. Come on, how does that not work? You're crazy. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you. I'll tell you uh, something that uh, that, uh, that does work. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> like sometimes direct commercials, right? And which is which which is so hard for actors. I never I auditioned for like them for like three times and said, fuck this. It's so hard. Yeah, because it's this such a little swing you have to like you have a line or something. And 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 yeah. Do you watch the other two? I don't know what that is. It's a great show. I reckon put a link we'll in put a- other two. It's a hilarious show about uh, two siblings whose 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 little brother becomes like Justin Bieber famous. Right, and it's about is it kind of like you and your family in a way? Um, no, because I didn't become Justin Bieber famous, but um, it, it it it's Molly Shannon who's a genius is, mm-hmm. is is the mom, and it's just very very funny, and and you, I think you're you'd like it. The sense of humor is very funny. Anyway, her brother is a struggling actor, and part of season one is watching him go on auditions, which is very funny. That's my digression. Um, there was a, I was auditioning actors for a commercial and a woman and, and, you know, people come in, they call it a cattle call. I mean, people literally, you're seeing like six people at a time. Hundreds and, of them. And it's, it's, it's really tough for actors. But I remember this one woman had a way of saying her name that would make us laugh. I think her name was Jesse Merriweather. <laughs> and I still remember it. Oh. It just came in my brain. Because she would come in and when you know, hey Tim Smith, uh, uh, Bob Evans, uh, hey um, Jim Goldberg, Goldberg, Jesse Merriweather, and that wasn't her real voice. No, right. And it just made us giggle. You uh, still remember it? I remember her fucking name. Did you get it? Um, <laughs> I don't know if she. I've cast her before. I don't know if she got that particular part, but she's she's. It's just an example of kind of this sort of thing where you stand out. Why does that work for commercial but not for something else? Um, is there was no prop involved and it was so simple. Right. Um, in the land of commercials, you'll find that some people, they, they, they come up with an innovative way to stand out a little bit. Yeah. Because this woman is totally the look for the part. Nice. But so are the six women standing next to her. Five. <laughs> six total, you said. <laughs> it must be so hard to date you. Undateable. That's why you're the star of Undateable. I wasn't the star. I was the six, six lead, lead. Six lead. Put up a thumbnail. <laughs> Put up to a clip. You might want to stand in front of a mirror and quote Michael Jackson and say, "I'm, I'm looking, bad. I'm gonna. No, not, I'm bad. I'm gonna. I'm looking to you to make the change or whatever the lyric is." Did you watch the whole series? No, it's unwatchable. Oh, you're on date on, on uh, six lead. Yeah. Oh no, I would have watched that because you're very funny. I'm gonna send it to you. Listen. It's a half hour total. There's five episodes. The one I was in, I watched, and that was watch, funny. Watch them all. Okay, I will put me in stuff. I almost did. You were, you were, I uh, know. you were up uh, up for the the son role in no. going in style. No, it was the dad, and I was too young. And you later, oh, I meant the son of Michael Caine, and you were oh, too yeah, young. Yeah. Um, P- Peter Serafinovich got it, who's yeah. substantially older than you. Yeah, you need to be believably Michael Caine's son. You're too young. Thanks, man. You look good too. I did a commercial audition and I gave him the headshot and I didn't get the commercial for reasons you sometimes you don't get it. And they called me and they said, hey, we want to, we got to put you in something. You're, that headshot thing is so funny. And I got another thing from oh, it. Oh, well, there you go. I'm wrong. Everybody out there who's an actor, come up with a bit involving your headshot. <laughs> um, the, the intention behind that was I always felt insecure giving a headshot. I, I don't have a good looking picture of me. It feels weird giving you a picture of me. So that was how it started. <laughs> This is, this is probably Schwimmer's headshot. Yeah, probably. You would be shocked at how difficult it was to get those printed. Nobody, because there's like, you know, because you look, that's not a proper stock. If you look at the back, it's like a photo, thick photo paper. Yeah. None of the head, I went to so many headshot places and none of them, including when I would submit it digitally and you would think it would just be kind of like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just logistically, <laughs> oh, no one touches it. they're making that. sure you're not uh, catfishing. They're saying that's not. That's not you. And they wouldn't do it. And I had to have my agency do it within their, their office. Well, why wouldn't you just do it like on a, at a Kinko's or something? Um, a photo printer place. Do they still have Kinko's? Probably not. But nowadays- I don't talk to the working man. Of course they do. They have still have Kinko's? Kinko's offices. I'm yeah, there's Kinko's. Kinko's and FedEx. Oh, they merged. Yeah. Um, congrats on that, by the way. It was a big acquisition. Yeah, congrats, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, though. It's good to know that a headshot place in 2022. Well, is, I had a printer a while ago, but yeah. That many years ago is still uh, wor- hey, the, worried about catfishing. If I've said it once, I don't remember saying it. But headshot places are pretty much the only ethical place, 
uh, businesses in this, biz- <laughs> you know. But you know what's funny though? Like this, David Schwimmer probably has one of the most recognizable faces yeah. in the, at least in the country. I would recognize him just by the hairline. In the country, and um, it's funny. <laughs> it's also he looks enough like us, <laughs> like us. I, 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 he beat me out actually. For I went friends? on a podcast for no. I went on a podcast. Um, they were doing this podcast for. Um, um, what was the Spielberg um, uh, epic war uh, miniseries? Um, 19, no, 1917. I know what you're talking about. I, I listened to the- A uh, guy didn't get cast in it, and he made a whole- and he, Oh, it's called Dead Eyes. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, this actor- Do I wear my hat, or am I, am I okay? You're fine. I was you're, you look a little right. sweaty, but- It's wet. I, I it looks like he ran, ran far in the heat. Were you running before this? <laughs> I showered before. Oh, it's wet. It's wet. Yeah, that's why I wear the hat. Whatever. Sometimes I, I look at myself when I'm editing. I'm like, oh, I need to have somebody on set with me. There was once I almost didn't post, but I'm like, you can't not post because you're ugly. That's a good title for a podcast. <laughs> this podcast was um, called Dead Eyes, and just to just to let you know the premise, he 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 got cast in as a like a two line part in this epic miniseries. Um, I'm forgetting the title. It'll come to me. Um, and that Spielberg and Tom Hanks were making. Sorry, Tom Hanks was the executive producer. I think Spielberg was involved. Anyway, he doesn't. He gets he gets taken out of the contention or fired because he hears that Tom Hanks says he has dead eyes. He has he had like two lines. Fuck. And it was scarring for him. And this many years later, he um, went about trying to interview anyone and everyone who had been up for this miniseries. Um, and, and, and auditioned for it. And lots of, because lots of known actors at this uh-huh. point who've now had a career had auditioned for it. Right. And I was one of them and he had me on and I told him that uh, the part, I wasn't famous at the time, David Schwimmer of course was. And I was, I got a call back, I met Tom Hanks, it was so exciting. And then I didn't get it and David Schwimmer got my part. Um, they went with a celebrity. Um, and uh, so it's funny, I was about to laugh at you saying uh, guys like us. And of course, uh, yeah. but then there was Schwimmer getting my part in this miniseries. Can I look it up? It's yeah. going to annoy six, me. On the six Lee, we did a bit about how I said that I'm not good looking enough to be a heartthrob, but I could be a Jewish heartthrob. <laughs> and then you and I were going back and forth of who those people could be, the Jewish heartthrobs. And like we categorized ourselves in there. That's what made me think of that. Well, who were the Jewish heartthrobs? Drake. <laughs> I remember I think you said Drake. I don't know. Drake. Some... Maybe Goldblum. Did I say Drake? That's funny. Maybe you did. Maybe I did. If it was funny. Band I Band of so. Brothers. I'm sorry. That yes, was on the tip of my brain. Band of Brothers. Tip of your tongue. Tip of my lobe tongue. Lobe of your brain. It was on the lobe of my brain. L O M I B. Zach. Zach. Yeah, with a Z. Zach. We uh, uh, we got up to from uh, you being 13 to you being uh, to 1998, 23. And no, we did me. Um, in, in Hollywood, working at a French Vietnamese restaurant, and um, I auditioned for Scrubs. And um, you were relatively speaking, though, not a name actor for Scrubs. In fact, nobody no, really I was. was completely unknown. That's not true. There were a couple. I was I was up against. Um, I'm saying that they're on it, not what you went against. Oh, I was up against two names and thought there's no chance in hell. I'm, Schwimmer and who else? I'm not going to say who they are. But really? Is that a private thing? Um, I don't. I, I, it's, I think it's weird to, to call out people that were up for parts, and you even this many years later. I don't know. I guess I could understand that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. Um. Anyway, it was um, Mark Ruffalo and uh, Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> it, was, it was Ellen DeGeneres <laughs> and Mark Ruffalo exactly. <laughs> um, would you say it if they were now very successful? They are. They are both working actors. I just think I don't know. It's, well, it's, Ellen just got canceled. It's just a tag thing. I'm not gonna okay. talk about. Um, can I clear the mucus that's in my nose? Will you promise not to use it on the podcast? Uh, what sound effect would you? You know, why? I'll tell you what. I'll have diarrhea on you while it's happening, so the attention's drawn off. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> You're so weird. I do it sometimes, and I forget how much it takes out of me. <laughs> Wipe off your nose. You're so weird. Dude, There's you can't say be- that. You can't say that anymore. You can't call someone weird? Wow. I'm sorry. But you can't say Asperger's either, right? It's an old book. 
You can say, you know, actually people have commented. So Asperger's is no longer a clinical definition. In fact, I think you talked about this on your hit podcast, Real Friends, Fake Doctors. No, you said it wrong. Fake Doctors, Fake Friends. No. On iTunes only. No. Real Doctors. If this is my plug, let's get it right. May I try it again? We'll rewind that. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had a sneeze. Fake Doctors, the podcast. No. I'm sorry, what am I missing? Fake doctors. Real friends. Real friends. Where every episode is a unbelievable, not just recap, but like behind the scenes. Do you scene. really listen? I've listened to a few. Oh, I was, you were selling the shit out like you were like an avid listener. I'm really good at this because I do a lot of ads. Watch this. Can I do it? Can yeah. I do an ad for you? Uh, real friends first. Fake doctors, real okay. friends. So you guys, if you're not familiar, which I guess you've been living under a fucking rock, Fake Doctors, Real Friends, available wherever you can get, anywhere you want, right? Anywhere you get podcasts. Anywhere you can get podcasts. There's so much out there. And first of all, I just want to acknowledge you guys. Thank you so much to my Glassman Boppers and my Tyso Goblins for every week showing up. This has been such a fun episode, Zach. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. But with a sea of podcasts out there, what do I listen to? First of all, you already know me. I talk about it all the time. I'm a huge Scrubs fan. Not only did I work with the creator of the show, you you brought me in for auditions. You helped make one of the greatest web series, The Sixth Lead. I'm sorry, I'm plugging mine in there. But it's such a it's such a pleasure to have you here. But I listen. It's it's one of a few podcasts I listen to every week. Every episode because there was nine seasons, seven, but. <laughs> Every episode, we get behind the scenes. You get We bring in other guests who have been part of it. And it's really fun to see the dynamic, not just of the characters of the show, but the actors that helped bring it to life. Yeah. One of my favorite episodes was with, you know, <laughs> and it's just so, it's weird to say because I'm laughing a lot, but I don't even think of it as a comedy podcast. It's just like, it's just interesting it's and like engaging. It's like you're hanging out with your friends. It's like, I'm in, you ever go to a doctor's office and you're in the waiting room, and you're like, why do I have to get here so early because I'm waiting so long? I hate when that happens. <laughs> That's the plug. It's yeah. part of my plug. So I, whenever I go to a doctor's office, I listen to one of yours. Um, I do have a podcast where, we, where Donald Faison, on my co-star in Scrubs, and I rewatch episodes, and uh, we're going so fast. So the podcast won't be on forever because we already reached season six. But it's a blast, and you'll like it if you like Scrubs. And you can get it wherever you listen How many to episodes of the show are there? <clears throat> um do you, could we keep that one in? That one you can keep in because it didn't have a. I didn't. I didn't bring the mucus down from my. Just in case, put a fart sound over there. Can we get? A, can we? <laughs> can I ask you seriously about the Asperger's thing? Because I. I. Uh, what was the reason? Was did it have to do with Nazis that they stopped using that term? I, I mean, it, the poll of the over under of when you're going to bring up Nazis on this podcast. I heard somewhere, and I thought I would ask. Hans you, I Asperger. I should have Googled it before I came. But I thought that the that Asperger's was no longer acceptable because it relates somehow to a Nazi. Yeah. Well, if you go back far enough, it all relates Google to a Nazi. This. I could Google this, but I thought you could tell me because you're wise. Uh, Hans Asperger, who was actually hilarious, it was named after. However, it's not just because of that. I don't know if that's the. Was he a Nazi? Uh, I I don't know if he was a Nazi eh, as much Nazi-ish. as Nazi-ish. Right. Yeah, Nazi-ish. He was. He was like it's it's like. Uh, he was friends with the Nazis. It's okay. like Drake isn't in the NBA, but he's always on the floor. He's Nazi adjacent. N.A. <laughs> As we like to call not applicable, but so originally. I have, a, I have a genuine question, if you can be serious for a second. Um, it is true in the, uh, uh, the, in the community that people- The community. Of people uh, who used to say they had Asperger's, that right. they don't use that term anymore. So- Is that true? I like to equate this. And this is a maybe a bit of a reach, but I, uh, analogously, if you zoom out far enough, it makes sense to when people are referring to Latino people as Latinx. I see. That and, and it's like, uh, okay, that's fine. But when Latino people say, I don't want to be called that, and they're like, no, but you have to. It's like, well, it's case by case. Yeah, there was a, just a poll I saw recently, or this was on Bill Maher, and, and he said that there was a, there was a giant poll in... Hispanic people, Latin people don't want to be called Latinx. The people that are most often offended or feeling the need to step up are the people that it's not related to directly. And I think that's at least an interesting uh Do statistic. you find that with uh, fellow people who have- so, so I'll speak just for just for what I have experienced with people- Your anecdotal leaving experience. Thank you. I've referred to, people have referred to it as Asperger's and I don't correct them because I, what, I know what you're saying. Incidentally, let me put this aside. When people text me and they use the wrong your and then they send another one, I think you're fucking insecure. 
I know what you meant. I know you spelled it wrong. It's well, fine. you don't. That person, I've done. I do, I do that depending on the person. I don't want them to think that if, if it's insecure. You trying to control how they see you? I don't want uh, certain people to think that I would m purposefully mis okay. mistake my yours. Who are you okay with mistaking the your? I get it. You'll friends, say me. All friends. Who are who is somebody that you like? A business person, uh, uh, someone, uh, a producer I'm working with, uh, someone, um, you know, business business related things. Okay, back. So first, let me tell you that the Asperger's, the reason it's my understanding is, yes, uh, there is connection to Nazis. I don't know if that's why it changed because that's a good reason if it is. Yeah, but why now? I mean, we like Nazis in 2015. No, but no one wants to be Nazi adjacent. Nobody wants it to. Wasn't out. You know what? I would argue that more people now are okay <laughs> with Nazis. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you're in. so true. Do you know, by the way, when you say that kind of stuff, it's t more tactful? Like when you say, unfortunately, it's true about Nazis, intersocially, you're supposed to go, yeah, unfortunately, no, I, you know. Such a shame, you know. You have no, to. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's really tough, you know. And Trump, and I don't want to get into politics. So, <laughs> it's like, and look what's now what's happening with women, right? Yeah, so, he's, he's not in office anymore. You have to start anymore, whispering. You have yeah, to start whispering. Like, and listen, hey, you know, hey, you know, and you. Uh, so there was a there's a, a little bit of a stigma. So I've heard, um, because before Asperger's was thought of and referred to as high functioning type of autism, mm -hmm. and when you have high functioning, conversely, you have low functioning, mm -hmm. and when you refer to somebody as low functioning, it's, it's. First of all, that's not necessarily the case. Some people have more obstacles than others, but it's also, I, I like to, I look at people. On your show, for example. As we see it, Amazon Prime. Um, there are, aren't there um, people within the show that are on different levels of the spectrum? I, I only watched one episode, which was very good. Thank you. And uh, there's an actor who can't, make it a character who can't make it to to the coffee shop yeah whereas your character dude i'm at a coffee shop like that yeah you can go to the coffee shop like that so how do you uh, how do what's let the, me what? let me let me let me finish this real quick about the, the you high interrupt function to me can i interrupt you it's your show your show go on go ahead it's your show how does how does someone who doesn't want to offend anyone distinguish between those two different right. types of autistic people i think a bigger question is understanding not wanting to offend somebody. Because when you've had this idea, and I'm being serious now, when you're coming into a place not wanting to do something as opposed to wanting to do something, it's fear-based and you're not being able to be yourself. So I have found that when people are trying not to offend, then there are un more unwilling, in fact, unwilling uh, many times to ask questions because is that wrong? Is that right. offensive? And my thought is, if you're a good person, you're not wanting to offend. Don't let your lack of information get in the way of finding out. I know you feel safe with me and you're asking, but I think that's very directly related to this whole thing. Mm. Because first of all, Asperger's is now referred to as ASD level one. What was Asperger's is now autism one. There's like autism one, two, three. And they look at this as what are more obstacles, right? And obstacles don't necessarily mean you're low functioning. It may be you're nonverbal or you can't, you, you know, you need some help uh, with your, you can't be as independent as you like to be, but then you shine in these other categories that yeah. aren't what are conventional, aren't part of the conventional lifestyle. So it's not as appreciated or recognized, right? right. Um, there's a foundation, and I forget what it's called, but I just spoke with um, Jason Kadem's. Kathleen, his wife, she put this on and we did this, Ray Romano, me and some of our cast members, it was really nice and we spoke and I'll put up some information, but basically it's 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 uh, getting people who uh, are on the autism spectrum to be able to get jobs and skill sets that they could really shine in. Right. A lot of times it's tech behind the computer, sure. stuff like that. Doesn't mean they're low functioning, right? Right. Um, I don't know if it's because of the Nazi adjacent right. or if it's the fact where I understand it more of Asperger's, no, it's just Asperger's. It's not autism. Where people right. like, there's a judgment, there's a stigma to autism. Right, got it. Okay, that makes sense. I also have found that- And the Nazi thing. I, icing on the cake. <laughs> the Nazi thing, it was the Nazi icing on the cake. I, I feel like if there was a meeting and it's like, listen, stigma, blah, blah, blah. Some people weren't on board. I'm like, and listen, and if you're not on board- <laughs> I'm gonna close with- Let me show you this. <laughs> Are you a slide projector? And, and in closing- Nazi adjacent. Oh, no, not, oh sorry. <laughs> um, but I've also found from uh, my experience with autism, because when I was first diagnosed, I was very excited to talk about it. And I quickly stopped talking about it and got in, I was depressed for a very long time. Not just because of this, but I ended up getting in this depression because I became aware of how much I'm bothering Zach, all these things were. How did you get, I'm sorry if you've talked about this before, but can you give me a short, 
and, and, and maybe you don't want to talk about it. But yeah. can you tell me how one? Yeah. Because you were the the ultimate um, high functioning person to me. We, we're not supposed to say high functioning is the point. Just so you know. Okay. Well, then then cut it out. I don't want to cut that. We'll out. put farts over it. <laughs> but you could still keep in the audio, so you know what he said. I don't know how to talk. <laughs> I don't. I, I. You're doing the very thing that I, I'm. You know, I'm a friend, and I'm trying. I'm to, just leaning in. I'm being a little playful. I apologize I if this is a sensitive. It's not uh, sensitive for me. I'm trying to ask you a genuine whoa, question whoa, whoa, without whoa, standing whoa, whoa, on any whoa. landmines. How did you go about knowing to to get a sure. diagnosis? That's my question. Um, I mean, there might be people who are in, in the audience that you have who who want to go. Hey, maybe I could. You know, I've had a, a, actually. A, a fair amount of people, both from the podcast and then the podcast and the show, reach out to me that not only did they not know they were, they didn't know much about autism before and have since been diagnosed. Yeah, there you and go. it's something I'm, I'm really think is a really special part of what this podcast has been able to bring to people. We had a, a woman sense of call, awareness. In, call into our podcast, by the I way. I know. I, 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 I think I texted you after that. Uh, I think maybe you did. And Sorry, I'll She continue. was uh, 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 an autistic woman and she loved. Still is. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make my jokes too. I don't want to be insecure that it's too many jokes. I have not done a lot of jokes. This today. is your show, brother. You can do whatever you want. Thanks, man. She is and was autistic, and she called into the show to to ask a question because she loves Scrubs, and she said she loves your show. Um, yeah, and I texted you about that to thank you for also you. Had, and then I gave you a plug. You did because uh, I love. Also, you. I noticed an edit, and I might want to put it in here. Uh, you you. Uh, I don't know if you'll remember this, and I don't want this to seem like calling you out because I would say this if it wasn't me. Oh God! But you, uh, you were saying it's an actor, um, Rick Glassman, and I heard there wasn't a crossfade there, and I heard there was an edit, <laughs> and I bet I felt, oh, you had to look up my name. I didn't have to look up your name. I, I um, am I right that the, that was trimmed? You're right, probably because it wasn't. I did, <laughs> I, you know, I know you. Why didn't have to look up your name? There are no times. Offense. No, there are times when I when um. I, I have to pull up someone's name of course. and I don't want that in the show. Also, more often- Like what you did with Band of Brothers, are you okay with that? Because that's not a person. Band of Brothers is fine. When I do cut it out, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's someone who had a tiny part on the show so many years ago and I don't want their feelings to be hurt that their name wouldn't come to me. So I will quickly IMDB or, or, or we have this thing, Scrubs Wiki, and, 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 and go, oh yeah, it was Tony. And then I will cut that out because I don't want anyone's feelings to yeah. be hurt. Um, yours, of course, I know your fucking name. I just, it may have, I may have gone, uh, Rick, Rick Glassman. Yeah. Fine. I just noticed I'm just that mad that my editor isn't doing uh, good enough crossfades. I, I pick these, I don't know how many people pick it up, but this is, this is, if there's something that I do, that's what I do. But that's, I noticed you that know, that's a, someone who makes a po podcast and has OCD and sure. is listening for edits. I'm not listening for edits, but you recognize, as a director, you recognize when something is incontinuous, right? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, you and I are the same that way. What are we talking about? Autism. Right. Nazis. So um, when I first started talking about it, there were people that said to me, everything okay? Yeah, I'm just taking a deep breath. You know, I had a doctor say that to me once. I had a doctor, a general practitioner. I was going in for shoulder surgery. I was seeing him for something else. While I was there, I asked him a couple of questions about my shoulder where he then said, I, I don't know, I'm not the shoulder specialist. And I said, it seems like you're frustrated with me. Is there something I'm missing? And he said, I'll be honest. Whenever I come to the door and I see it's your name on the door, I take a deep breath. <laughs> now, this is funny, I understand, but this is my general practitioner. And, and I, I said, uh, I'm, uh, what, what is happening? What am I doing? He goes, you ask so many questions and I don't have enough time. And I said, well, you could just tell me that. I didn't know, but yeah. You switched doctors, first of all. Well, I did, not right away because it takes a little bit of time. Incidentally, coincidentally, I never know when. Within a few months, I got my autism diagnosis. And I said, hey, by the way, and that's, I started like, oh, I asked a lot of questions. I yeah. obsess over things. I said, I just want you to know this happened. And he goes, that makes so much sense. And after that, not by after that, the rest of that appointment and the next, I still went for months. He was comedically nice to me, talking to me about the Dodgers. I don't know anything about baseball. He was so nice. Oh, because he checked himself and he felt horrible. And it was such a turnoff to me. Yeah, fuck that guy. Because he he needed he needed a definition yeah, before he could have patience. I've switched, switched, switched yeah, doctors. Fuck that guy. But when I see do new doctors now, and you know as me. As a fake doctor, fuck that guy. And as a real friend, I appreciate that. <laughs> but when I see doctors now, and I do see doctors, I'm hormone stuff I'm going through and uh, geneticists I'm seeing, there's some stuff I'm trying to figure out. 
Um, I open up and I feel a little tacky because I don't want to be making an excuse or something, but I do say to them, I just want to let you know, and I'm not sure how relevant this is, but I do have autism and I tend to obsess over things and ask questions and I don't want to waste your time, but I just want you to know you could speak very directly with me. If you feel like I'm asking too much, just say, great. Which is why I love- Do you say that when you're on, on a yeah. date? Yeah, I've talked about this in the podcast. It's, it's, I've learned so much about communication since this, and yes- it kind of is a funny is a funny movie where a guy. I mean, you can't um, you can't make this movie, but or you can make this movie. Tell me, where where, where he finds out he has autism, and um, and leans into it. Okay, <laughs> May, can I tell you something? Because he he says, "Look, I'm just going to be totally fucking brutally honest and not censor myself." And 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 all of a sudden, he starts meeting the the the, the, the woman of his dreams and the job of his life and. Yeah, it's almost like yes, man, but a different version of yes, it. Like you, yes. you're living by this rule or something. Exactly. I, are you? Do you have another ten minutes with me? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Um, all right. What should we talk about? No, I'm just kidding. So listen, I want. I want to. Uh, We've been here an hour and a half. At a certain point, your, your listeners are going to get bored. They oftentimes these break two hours, but they're always at least ninety minutes. Okay. And I'll edit a lot of your stuff. I out. did another podcast recently. You're not even talking into the mic. <laughs> You could hear that, right? I have time off now, so I'm doing everyone who wanted me to do their podcast podcast. Oh, really? Yeah. This is podcast week. I don't mean to, that's not a humble brag. I'm saying I don't want to let anyone down who I care about. I thought about it a little bit, so you're going to like this. I guarantee you. Oh, why didn't you do that 90 minutes ago? Because truthfully, yeah. um, I am trying to control less stuff. Oh, okay, good. And good. I've noticed it. You're a doing a good times. job. By the way, there's not much compulsivity going on in this apartment. I think you lean obsessive, not compulsive. I am, have, it's been a while. I'm, that's, you see that desk I'm getting rid of? That was where I was editing. I have since got a new desk and I'm turning, uh, I'm moving stuff to upstairs and I'm, you're right. Why don't you just say, yeah, you're right. I, I said it too late, but you're right. <laughs> so I want to, I want to talk to you about the, the diagnosis, but I want to tell you the reason I want you, what you asked, but I also want to set that up for. The, what you're saying about the guy who's diagnosed. Yeah, are you going to make that movie? You can make that movie. So there's a lot of beats. I've talked about it before. If you're ever interested, I'm sure you don't care, but I could tell you. But let me just tell you, some things happened where I became a little bit aware of this. And do I have autism? That's kind of how it started. Like, I didn't know much of it. And then I'm somebody with autism and blah, 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 blah. So for years, a couple of years, I was thinking about it. I don't know if I do. Um, I found out that there's a... There's a Thing that you could do, it's five thousand dollars, and it's best for kids. It's harder to diagnose an adult because we've learned new tools to adapt in certain situations where it's not as easy to diagnose. Anyway, I'm in Bill Lawrence's basketball game, and I'm kicked out. Oh, and you're good. My jump shot sucks. Psych. That's like saying I ain't got a million bucks. I got a million bucks. I got a million nuts, got a million gives a fuck. You ain't passed the ball enough, eat my butt. You ain't checked the ball out, eat my butt. You shoot from too far, eat my butt. But you make it every time, no shit, slut, I'm the fucking man. No, I remember a bit of trivia that just came up to my brain is that you're good, right? Yeah. I'm fantastic. No, I hear you. I remember Bill, who's the cockiest motherfucker in the world when it comes to basketball yeah. and everything. Um, <laughs> I'm saying that you're actually really good. Yeah. So you must have been done something really off to get kicked out of the so game. So within two weeks, I was kicked out of a poker game and Bill's basketball game. What did you do to get kicked out of Bill's basketball? I don't want to know. I don't want to. No, know. it's great. By the way, when you said to me, I thought about that because it's probably a coincidence because you and Bill are an item in my head. You know, like yeah. I know you guys are, do the same are, thing. We are best buddies. You did something where you told me and which he did, he sent me an email that is the inciting incident to my diagnosis that if you were to read it, you would think it's rough and it's the most beautiful thing. It was a gift, me sincerely, because he told me the truth and he said, hey, bud, hey, handsome, as you know, he says, this is a tough email to send. Oof, um, I don't ever, you ever want that. I did. Well, I needed you needed it. it. I you needed, needed it. it. Yeah. Does he know that he was the inciting yeah. incident? Yeah, so th th there's more that comes from this, but some of the guys in the game don't like playing when you're here. And uh, you could disagree with anything, but uh, I think you may lack some awareness of how people receive you. And he gave me some examples of stuff. And I remember reading it thinking, I disagree with this. This makes sense. I'm embarrassed. And this feels bad. And I'm reading it almost to myself. Like, here's the guy that feels bad. And here's the guy reading it to him that, Rick, you need to know this. Like, mm. I remember that. And, you know, you're, he said... Uh, 
you know, you're constantly the last one picked. And in my head, I'm the first one picked. Um, some guys don't play when I'm going to be there. I, I'm not going to be in the NBA, but I, my confidence came from basketball. My first friends came from basketball. I play very it's hard. It's weird. You thought to yourself, this is weird because I'm good. This is weird because I'm the best. Right. <laughs> you know, like that's how far off I am. Right. And, uh, but what I did know is whether or not I agree with whatever I agree or disagree with, I had no idea people felt this way. That's right. what I was saying about loud or not. It's too loud for you. Like that's information that is relevant, whether yeah. I agree or not. And um, also I'm playing aggressive and I'm yelling and I'm just being whatever I am that's too much. And these are, you know, 50 year old comedy writers who are trying to just, you have know, fun. have a good time, which apparently means losing and sitting and waiting. Not a good time to me, but to each their own. <laughs> I got to go get fucking checked right. <laughs> you know, as soon as that happens. Also, I was kicked out of a poker game, which- Did you get an email for that one? Uh, I got a call also, and I don't need to get into it, but a whole bunch of boring guys, I was hysterical. <laughs> apparently I'm like, oh, are you going to fold this? This is such a good movie. You got to write this movie. So let me tell you this. I, I, I'm inspired and I, I, a year, two years later, I'm writing this thing. Uh, and I actually filmed something where Joel McHale plays Bill and the script was the email. And it's, we're playing basketball. That's what we cut to a clip of. I made it three years ago. And uh, incidentally, I was, when I did the sixth lead, while editing it, I realized how much, at least the way I think, if not everybody, I write in editing. And how much, what I would do different or if I did more. And I thought... While I'm writing this thing, because I'm still new, I would like to film it, edit it, find the tone. I think it will help me. I don't know what I'll do with it. So I did that, and I wrote this thing, and Bill and I, and J shout out to John Stern. He produced A Futile and Stupid Gesture, a movie I did. Um, we were going out to pitch it, and then I booked As We See It, mm. playing an autistic character. Mm. So not only am I not allowed to be in another show for exclusivity reasons, I was a little sensitive to the idea of doing too much autism stuff. Put it right, as, but why don't you write the write it as a feature, and maybe you direct it and don't star in it. Well, actually, uh, in this day and age, you would need to start. I would it. need to start in it. Yeah. So I did. I wrote. I have a draft, and then I was working on it, and I just it's my own problem. But the podcast and the show, and I haven't prioritized it. And I actually, I'm getting ahead now on purpose. I'm pre-recording episodes, so all of July I'm not doing any podcast stuff, and I want to revisit this movie. You should. It uh, sounds like a great premise, and I, I like your the, what you're saying. The tone of uh, not the tone, but the in the spirit of yes man, or um, yeah, I mean, like I, I, someone who really fully, finally realizes, like, hasn't this epiphany, and then leans into it, and their whole life changes because they didn't know, and it changes the way they date mm -hmm. for the better, the way they get, the way they are in their job for the better. That correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, I'll send you a draft. I'll need your help. Um, that is what me coming out of. But at first, I need to be. I have a bit where it's like Groundhog Day, just solely in the example of at first. Yeah. He's miserable, and then he starts to learn how to wield it to his benefit. By him being miserable, does that also lead to him being maybe inappropriate or him being not him? Yeah, all the things you went through, getting kicked out of a basketball game, getting... Um, oh, you but, mean after the diagnosis? Because cause I feel like the diagnosis needs to be the inciting incident of the movie, right? It needs to happen early on. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. In the first half. Because in I, real life, I, I, afterwards, I, I, le I was learning. And yeah. this is, he's choosing. Page 30, he goes to the doctor, gets the diagnosis. So end of act one is diagnosis. Yes. <laughs> really? I think so. I mean, you, you just said that, and I think you're probably right. Because the, the, the rest of the, 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 you know, stereotypically in screenwriting world, it's like on, by, by page 30, you know, it's typically half hour in. We start our journey. The characters uh, entering the new world. Everything, the, the first act is, it, this is the way things have been. This, ha, this is the status quo. Um, but what's different about today, this day, is that, that X sounded happened. very Jewish. X, X happened, and that leads me uh, to go on a journey, which begins on page 31. But that is, what is, what is different from this day from all other days? It's what we say in Passover, right? <laughs> no, why is this night different yeah, yeah. from all other nights? So I originally had it at the end of Act 1, and the reason I changed it was because, um, <laughs> was this ridiculous that we're talking about this No, now? I just laughed at myself at something in my head. It's a joke that I didn't say out loud, but I, I, I'm not going to say it. Gosh, I really love Rick, but this is fucking taking forever. And it's so hot out today. And the ice melted in my 
water thing. I wonder if he'll give me ice or if he's gonna be like really OCD weird about his ice. I just wanna go. No, no, that's not fair. I love Rick. Just tell me what you were thinking. I don't want to. Oh, I almost forgot actually. I noticed, do you need a little ice? Fucker. I'd love some ice, thank you. Thank you. Help yourself. Hang on the way out, I'll, I'll pop it in there. Oh, did you want to go? Soon. Is that why you looked at your watch? <laughs> no. All right, well, let's end it, man. That's Real Doctors, Fake Friends on Amazon Prime. Zach, thanks for coming over, That's man. That's the worst fucking plug ever. I will do the plug correctly. I left the fridge open again. Oh, my God. All right, do it correctly. You know, you set the stereotype of neurotic Jews back a lot of years. You know, I, I have said on this podcast before that I feel like this is... Jewish, uh, anti-Jewish propaganda. It is, it is. Like people that watch us are like, see? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those people that hate us, uh, they Jews will not replace us. Those people, they 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 listen to this podcast and go, see? Shout out to Hans Asperger, by the way. I'll put his Instagram <laughs> handle up here. <laughs> Instagram. All right, plug whatever, and uh, I definitely don't want to miss my dismount anymore, so you can get out of here. Oh. Does, Hans, does Hans Asperger have an Instagram handle? Yeah, he's actually really funny. <laughs> Um, it's all memes. Um, since since we have the luxury of... Wait, get, let me get my real fucking plug Could in. you plug it to my mom? Can I bring my mom down for one second? Will you plug it to my mom and then you'll get out of here? No, I don't want to do that. Really? No, you don't have to meet my mom. I didn't realize you want to meet my mom. I'll meet your mom, but I mean... Uh, she's, a, she's a favorite on the podcast. Uh, let's not have it be part of the show. I'll meet her on the way out and say, Hi, Mrs. Glassman. Shalom, Baruch Hashem. Don't bother. Um, it's called Fake Doctors, Real Friends. And it's, you can get it anywhere you get a podcast. Anywhere. And if you like Scrubs, uh, or even if you don't like Scrubs, right. you, just, you will still giggle. We recap episodes and tell old stories. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Well, Dax. 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 Uh, You're not the first person to say that. You know, you know everyone thinks uh, Dax and I look alike, um, and we do. Um, one day we're going to make like a separated at birth movie. What's it going to be called? Separated at birth? I don't know, but just think about like he's raised in, like he's raised in this. You were two, you know, two two twins that got adopted and went separate directions. Of course, you were raised in the big city. New York. I was, he was no, raised in the I swamps. I was raised in super Jewish, um, like uh, Jersey suburbs, and he's raised in like you know the South and or the Florida uh, wetlands. Right, he's got to be in the wetlands, <laughs> and also he has to have hay. <laughs> <laughs> he drives one of those tour boats for gators when they when the, you know the big fans on of the back yeah. from uh, Waterboy. Uh, I just did that. I was down in Florida. Uh, um. <laughs> you were the one that wanted to go. Now, where I was just down in Florida, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna reset with a down in Florida. You were oh a fan boat, God. were you? <laughs> it was. You know who would like you to know hear about this? Is my mom. You know who I went with? Um, you have to edit this out because like no, we're putting mustaches name. on you on every snap. <laughs> Mustache off. <laughs> Ow. Oh, oh. <laughs> See, in my head, we're having a good time, but you want to leave. It's confusing. I ain't having a good time. I love you, but it's you know, it's been it's been a, it's been an hour forty four. We'll come back sometime. You should put tape over that so your guests don't know. Like it's a like casino? when you go to, no no you know, you go to the therapist and they always have a secret clock that you can't see what they can see. I know because they go like this. They go like this. Yeah, they do like a little up up look. I pay very close attention to people's eye lines. You now. probably notice that. Oh yeah, because that's something you'd be sensitive to. It's actually so distracting because I notice it and I don't know when to ask what it means. What about when you're on these business Zoom calls and you see you, the person's clearly reading emails? I hate that. I hate <laughs> Zoom so much. I hate it so much. It's impossible to connect. I've had some opportunities to have some cool podcast guests and they wouldn't have them on. I won't do Zoom. I've had pitches, or I'm not the one pitching. I'm directing it, and the two young writers are pitching their hearts out, and I'm sitting there because I'm going to, if the thing is sold, I'll direct it. And I say my two cents and then they're off to the races with their pitch and I'm watching the windows and you can see these mm -hmm. executives are like just looking down, looking at their phone, answering a quick email. Yeah. And you're like, that is the rudest. They think that we don't see. We see. We see. We see. I mean, listen, it's literally a tight shot. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I can choose which picture uh -huh, to click uh -huh. on. We see. When I have people on the podcast or it, it, even just talking, when And I stop talking. And not passive aggressively, I stop. And they, they say, you could sit and I say, it's totally fine to check your phone, but I can't talk to you while you're doing that. Yeah. Because I hate it. Yeah, that's rude. Yeah. So you were in Florida. I was in Florida and Rob Delaney and I, um, Rob Delaney, <laughs> who is on the show that I was guest starring on. Um, he's very funny. He's a very funny man and he's a very good human being. Mm -hmm. And he said, we had a lot of downtime down there. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Oh, 
<laughs> well, I'm not the star of the show. Vince Vaughn is the star of the show. Oh, that's Bill, the other Bill yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, I did a little, a uh, couple episode arc on it. And um, it's not much of an arc if it's two episodes, is it? It's more of a 90 degree angle. Smart. What do you call this if it's 90 degrees of a, of a circle? An inverse cosine. Yeah. A backwards lowercase r. It's a, a lowercase r is pretty accurate without the little tip on the side. Yeah. And which I think now more than ever, it's important to say that it doesn't matter if you have a tip or no tip. I think all R's are the same. I like, a, I like an army helmet on my, on my, I mean, on my penis. More old fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> I just went to see the show um, that had so many penises in it. Oh, you got to tell me about it. Um, it was... Uh, Guys, come on in. What the hell? It's fine. Open your mouth. I don't want this. Right. Cut. <laughs> I can't even picture what that twelve thousand dollars. <laughs> that was twelve thousand dollars. Shout out to Tom, by the way, who who is our animator. Tom Dot Bates. So you saw a show with a lot of penises. Tell me more. And then you got to tell me about the fan boat, and then I'll let you get out of here. You could leave whenever you want. You could literally we get in right now. You'd be a great. On you. You'd be a great detective. Hey, we're not holding you. We're not holding you. <laughs> you are not detained. You're free to leave. But I wouldn't once leave. you leave, it's going to be harder for us to help you. And we can't protect you. Yeah. You can leave. You don't have a lawyer. You can get a lawyer, of course. But I actually recommend you do get a lawyer. In fact, of course you're going to get a lawyer. You need to lawyer up. But if you could help us now, it's, it's probably going to be better for you in the long run. And I shouldn't be saying this. I know it wasn't you. <laughs> okay, we need the information from it. Nothing would make me happier than for you to. I mean, that's another good I idea. Mean. On the spectrum, detective. OTSD. It's called Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock. <laughs> OTSD. I'd watch the hell out of that. <laughs> D. OTSD. Oh, 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 wasn't that? Oh no, that was obsessive compulsive disorder. The the Tony Shalhoub show. Monk. Monk. I never watched it. He always beat me every time I ever was nominated for anything during Scrubs. He beat me. Ugh. Shaloub. At least you got nominated. I think you'll get nominated for your show. Not enough people have seen the show. I, by the time this comes out, we'll have found out. So I'll do two reactions, much like you did with the A, B, C. C. I can't believe I got nominated. Oh, fuck. You, but you're free to go. So now it's on you. That's what I do when I go on dates. I do that. I say. A big sigh? No, I say. Um, I say. Uh, I sometimes get really silly. And I might miss that I'm being too weird. So you ha I ask you this, just do me a favor. Give me the benefit of the doubt one time. If I'm being weird and you're like turned off or something, just tell me. On date one, you say this? On, on, uh, sometimes I'll say it if, if we're texting or on FaceTime before we even meet. I say, wow. I just want you to know I'm a goofy boy. And I'm going to be silly. And if you're not into that, that's fine. But you might have to tell me. But you don't tell them about um, OTS. Oh, I want to tell you this uh, anecdote, but it's maybe a few minutes. No, I want to hear it. Okay. It's about Florida. <laughs> Rob Delaney invited me on a gator boat because we had downtime and uh, it was a lot of fun. Sorry. All right. Well, that's uh, that Zach was Efron. This was uh, fun. No, Braff. Braff. I'm sorry. That is uh, Braff Efron on the Take Your Shoes Off podcast. Make sure to check him out. I'll on tell you one last funny story. I can't <laughs> wait. But unfortunately, we're going to have to. But stick around for patreon.com slash take your shoes off for this last anecdote. My name's Rick Glassman. And good night. <laughs> Theme music. Scoop. Thank you so much for coming. I think you're so funny. I really do. I think you're really you special. You are exhausting. I, it's, I just have to say, I love you. That's not fair, though, because you said you want to go. I, 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 I'm laughing. I'm then laughing. What, then what's the problem? I'm laughing at how, what a character you are. You're like a. But what, you, the first 90 minutes of this was me going, oh, so, oh, it's college. And I was doing boring <laughs> bullshit. So tell me about your, when you get, you know. That was boring? Boring. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It was really great. But, you know, like, this is just the end. This was playtime. Okay. What were you going to say? Am I free to leave? <laughs> You've been free to leave since the ice bit, and I told it's you that. It's better for you if you stay. <laughs> All I'm saying is, and I shouldn't even be telling you this. I do have to take a polar to you, though. Okay, do it. Now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for having me. Blabbity blue.